Section twenty one of The Diary of a Country Parson by James Woodford. Read by John Greenman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seventeen seventy eight. January third. Bill went out a shooting again today, and he brought home just nothing at all, though he had several shots at pheasants and missed every one. January fifth. Bill went out a shooting again this morning, and he killed only one small thrush. My servant man Ben spent the day at his father's by my leave. Suki went out in the afternoon and returned in the evening with her sister, who laid at my house. N. B. I did not know of her going out, nor of her sister sleeping here till after ten at night. I think it is taking too great liberties with me to bring home a stranger to sleep here. I do not like it at all, as every servant may do the same. January 6th. We breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Suki's sister breakfasted here and then went home. I did not speak one word to her, as she came unasked. Bill went out a-shooting again this morning, and he brought home only four blackbirds. Gave Bill this evening for powder, and shot two shillings sixpence. January 19th. This being the day for the Queen's birthday to be kept, Bill fired my blunderbuss three times, each charge three caps of powder with a good deal of paper and tow on it. I fired him off in the evening with three caps of powder also. January 22nd. I took a ride about two o'clock and my servant Will with me to Justice Buckton's at Easton Reeds, and there I dined and spent the afternoon with the Justice and Mr. DeKean. We had for dinner a boiled leg of mutton and a hare roasted. Gave Mr. Buxton's servant boy coming away one shilling. About six o'clock we went from Mr. Buxton's. Mr. DeKean went home in his carriage, and I went on to Norwich, where I supped and slept at the King's Head, as did my nephew. Mr. Buxton has a very good house and a very fine situation, with a pleasing prospect from the same. After we drank coffee at our inn this evening, we went on to the playhouse, and as we did not get in till after the third act, we paid only one shilling sixpence each for seats in the front box. The play was the Maid of the Oaks, with a fête champêtre, which was very pretty, and the entertainment was The Deuce is in Him. I went away from the playhouse before the entertainment began. My nephew stayed all the time. January 23rd. Mr. Don, myself, and nephew took a walk after breakfast to the new Birmingham shop in London Lane, and there I bought a pruning knife and two razors with cases to them for two shillings sixpence. Knife, sixpence. Razors, two shillings. Two shillings sixpence. January 27th. Mr. Duquesne called on me at Weston this morning and stayed with me some time, he told me that a meeting of the nobility, gentry, and clergy of the county of Norfolk would be held to-morrow morn at the Maid's Head at Norwich for opening a subscription to advance a regiment in these critical times for the king. He asked me if I should be there, which I promised. Accordingly, he and Bill set forth for Norwich. January 28th. We breakfast, supped, and slept at the king's head. To my barber this morning gave one shilling— after dressing myself, I walked by myself down to the maid's head to the meeting of the nobility, clergy, etc., Lord Townsend, Mr. Townsend, Sir John Woodhouse, Sir William Jernigan, Mr. de Grey, the Lord Chief Justice's son, a Mr. Masham, Colonel Dickens, etc., present. Sir John Woodhouse was chairman and opened the business of the meeting, and he was answered by one Mr. Wyndham, who spoke exceedingly well with great fluency and oratory but on the wrong side. Lord Townsend spoke after him, but is no orator at all. Mr. de Grey then spoke very well, and after him, Mr. Townsend. Note, see page 211. The question was then proposed by the chairman that all those gentlemen that were against the subscription would retire, and many there were that retired. The subscription then was opened, and Lord Townsend subscribed five hundred pounds, Sir John Woodhouse also, I believe, did the same, and some others. Mr. Duquesne was there, and he subscribed twenty guineas. Towards the end of the second sheet I subscribed five guineas, 
There were many others that followed my example. N.B. I did not pay my subscription as many did not. The money is to be advanced as it is wanted. I dined and spent the afternoon at the Maid's Head with the rest of the nobility and clergy and gentry. We had about forty that sat down to dinner. Sir John Woodhouse, Lord Townsend, Mr. Masham, Mr. Townsend, Sir William Jernigan, Colonel Dickens, Mr. De Grey, Mr. Duquesne, etc., etc., dined there. I sat between Colonel Dickens and Mr. Duquesne. The Colonel was at Christ Church in Oxford, a student there, therefore he and myself had a long conference. The Colonel lives at Durham, and asked me to his house. The subscription amounted to near five thousand pounds. The subscription is to be kept open at Kerrison's. There was also a meeting of the opposite party at the White Swan today to protest against it. The above Mr. Wyndham was one of them. Most people admired the manner of Wyndham speaking, so much elegance, fluency, and action in it. For my ordinary paid three shillings, extraordinary one shilling, total four shillings. My nephew dined and spent the day at the King's Head. Mr. Duquesne and myself went from the meeting about six o'clock and drank tea with Mr. Priest and his wife. After tea, Mr. Duquesne went home with Mr. Townsend. I then called on my nephew, and we went to the play. As we went in after the third act, I only paid three shillings. The play was The Provoked Husband and Bon Ton the Farce. We sat in the center box, which was quite full. Sir William Jernigan was in the same box and spoke to me as he came out. A very good house tonight. We slept in our own beds at the King's Head tonight. The Mr. Wyndham, who spoke exceedingly well, is the celebrated William Wyndham, 1750 to 1810, friend of Dr. Johnson, scholar, diarist, and statesman. He was educated at Eton and Oxford. His first appearance in public life was the occasion here referred to by the diarist. His liberal opinions, however, changed under the influence of the French Revolution. From 1784 to 1802 he represented Norwich in Parliament, and in 1794 he joined Pitt's administration as Secretary for War, a position he held till 1801. He was again War Secretary in the Ministry of All the Talents, 1806 to 1807. He was a very remarkable man, a good Greek and Latin scholar, fluent in French and Italian, and a student of mathematics. His diary, 1784 to 1810, is of very considerable interest, edited in 1866 by Mrs. Henry Baring. It is in his diary, pages 30 to 34, that occurs the memorable description of Dr. Johnson's last hours and the words addressed to Wyndham, God bless you, my dear Wyndham, through Jesus Christ, and concluding with a wish that we might meet in some humble portion of that happiness which God might finally vouchsafe to repentant sinners. See the diary and the notice of Wyndham in the D.N.B. February 8th. We had for dinner today the finest and fattest turkey cock roasted that I ever saw. It was two inches thick and fat upon the breast after it was roasted. We had nothing else besides as it weighed fourteen pounds. February 12th. Mr. Duquesne called on me this morning about eleven o'clock, and about twelve I took a ride with him to Ling, and there we dined and spent the afternoon at Mr. Baldwin's with him and his wife and youngest daughter, and Mr. Priest of Reefham. Mrs. Baldwin seems to be of a gloomy complexion, with a beard. Before dinner we went into Mr. Baldwin's boat and went up the river a little way to take up some hooks that were laid for jacks, but never a fish. Having done that, Mr. Duquesne, Mr. Priest, and self went and saw the paper mills close to Mr. Baldwin's. Mr. Duquesne and myself bought a ream of writing paper, twenty quires belonging to the same. I had one half and he the other, ten quires apiece. I paid for mine five shillings. The master, Mr. Hammerton, went with us and showed us the whole machinery which is indeed very curious. We had for dinner at Mr. Baldwin's some fricasseed rabbit, some mutton steaks, a piece of roast beef, a fine rich plum pudding, tarts, and sillybubs. At quadrille this evening at Mr. Baldwin's lost ninepence. 
gave Mr. Baldwin's servant man one shilling. I returned home about eight o'clock. Mr. Duquesne and Mr. Priest slept there. February 23rd, we breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Bill went out a-coursing this morning on my little mare, and Mr. Hardy went out with him, and they brought home nothing at all, though out for five hours and three greyhounds. To Mr. Carey on Ann Taylor, my maid's account for a gown, two shifts, and other small matters paid him one pound nine and a half pence. To Mr. Carey also for things from Norwich, etc., paid four shillings sixpence. To my smuggler, Andrews, for a tub of gin, had of him January 16th, paid him this morn one pound five shillings. February 27th we breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. My nephew and self walked to church this morning at eleven o'clock, and there I read prayers only, being a day appointed for a general fast on account of the war with the Americans. I had a large congregation. My servant Ben went after dinner to his father's unknown to me, and did not return home till near eleven at night, and when he came home he went to bed without my seeing him, and I believe not very sober. It is very bad of him. March 1st. Read prayers and preached this morning at Weston. Neighbor Gooch's father was taken very ill today and thought to be dying. I sent him tent wine, and in the afternoon went and saw him and read prayers by him. He desired to have the sacrament administered to him, which I told him I would do it to morrow morning. Poor Gooch has been an invalid for many years. His pulse, I thought, was pretty regular. He had been convulsed in one of his hands, but talked pretty cheerful and well. My clerk's wife, Jane Smith, got immensely drunk, I hear, today. March 2nd. Poor neighbor Gooch died this morning about seven o'clock. I was quite surprised to hear of it indeed, as he did not appear to me yesterday near his latter end. I hope that, as his intention was to receive the sacrament this morning, that his will will be to the Supreme Being taken as if the deed had been done. March 7th. My man Ben went to Norwich with my brinded cow and calf to sell on the hill, which were sold by Mr. Burton for the sum of five pounds seven shillings sixpence. Mr. Burton had bought me a cow and calf, and which were had home March 5th. They cost six pounds. March 21st. The papers mention a war with France to be inevitable, and will ere long be publicly proclaimed. Note see page 230 and footnote pages 240 to 41 april 7th my nephew and self took a walk about eleven this morning to mr howe's and there we dined and spent the afternoon with him and his wife mr bottom and mr and miss don we spent the afternoon in fishing mr howe's pond i lent him my large dragnet and my cart carried it over for him and harry dunnell will and ben went with the same. We caught vast quantities of fish called cruisers. They are a very beautiful fish of a yellow hue, and none very large, almost all the same size, some few carp and tench. I gave Mr. Howes twenty brace of stock tench, and he gave me in return fifty brace of cruisers. My folks all dined at Mr. Howes, and then came away. We had for dinner some stewed carp, some cruisers fried, which were very good indeed, a fillet of veal roasted, and a ham, and some mince pies and tarts. April 10th. Had a prodigious large leg of pork of Billy Bidewell this afternoon, and which weighed twenty-eight pounds and one-half, and for which I owe him. April 15th. We breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home, brewed a vessel of strong beer to-day, my two large pigs, by drinking some beer grounds taking out of one of my barrels to-day, got so amazingly drunk by it that they were not able to stand, and appeared like dead things almost, and so remained all night from dinner-time to-day. I never saw pigs so drunk in my life. I slit their ears for them without feeling. April 16th. We breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. My two pigs are still unable to walk yet, but they are better than they were yesterday. They tumble about the yard, and can by no means stand at all steady yet. 
In the afternoon my two pigs were tolerably sober. April 18th. Between five and six in the evening I took a ride to Honingham and buried one Willen, late a schoolmaster there, and who died very sudden being taken as he came from Durham. His son and daughter attended him to the grave and were much concerned for their father. Pray God comfort them. None but those that have lost their parents can feel that sorrow which such an event generally produces. April 24th. Who should come to my house about two o'clock this day but my cousin, James Lewis, from Nottinghamshire, and on foot, and only a dog, by name careless, with him? He was most miserably clothed, indeed, in every respect. He dined and supped and slept at my house. He slept with my nephew in the yellow chamber. He looked much better than when we saw him in Somerset last, in health. April 25th cousin Lewis breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at Weston. I gave Lewis a tobacco-box this morning, a pair of shoes, a pair of stockings, a pair of breeches and shirt and stock, and an old coat and waistcoat. May 16th, at about seven o'clock this evening, who should arrive at my house in a post-chaise and pair but Mr. Pounceset and Sister Pounceset. He had been expecting them, but did not know exactly when they would arrive. They had come that day one hundred miles. They set out from Ansford on Wednesday morn last, and they came by way of London, and in a post-chaise all the way from London. They were much tired, especially my sister, but she was pretty tolerable. They supped and slept at my house. I was exceeding glad to see them, but did not expect them so soon. They slept in my yellow chamber, and Cousin Lewis and Bill slept up in the garret over my chamber. May 18th. We all breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at Weston. This morning I had my great pond drawn to show Mr. Pounceset and Jenny some diversion, and we had the largest pike we caught for dinner, and it weighed seven pounds. Mr. Pounceset and Jenny said they never eat so fine a fish in all their lives. It was prodigious nice indeed. In the evening I took a walk and showed Mr. Pounceset and Jenny my church, etc., they being not at church on Sunday, as it rained much that day in the afternoon. May 21st. We all breakfast, dined, and slept again at Weston. I walked up to the White Hart with Mr. Lewis and Bill to see a famous woman in men's clothes by name Hannah Snell. Note, Hannah Snell, 1723 to 1792, had enlisted in 1745 after being deserted by her husband, a Dutch seaman. It was not till 1750 that she revealed her military adventures, a book of them being published under the title The Female Soldier, The Surprising Adventures of Hannah Snell, which the author of the notice of her in the D.N.B. considers much embroidered. She married a second and third time. An account of her extraordinary career will also be found in Fortescue's monumental History of the British Army. Hannah Snell, who was twenty-one years old, as a common soldier in the army, and not discovered by any as a woman. Cousin Lewis has mounted guard with her abroad. She went in the army by the name of John Gray. She has a pension from the crown, now of eighteen pounds five shillings per annum, and the liberty of wearing men's clothes, and also a cockade in her hat, which she still wears. She has laid in a room with seventy soldiers and not discovered by any of them. The forefinger of her right hand was cut off by a sword at the taking of Pondicherry. She is now about sixty years of age and talks very sensible and well, and travels the country with a basket at her back, selling buttons, garters, laces, etc. I took four pair of fourpence buttons and gave her two shillings sixpence. At ten o'clock we all went down to the river with our nets a-fishing. At Lensway Bridge we caught a prodigious fine pike which weighed eight pounds and half, and it had in his belly another pike of above a pound. We caught also there the finest trout I ever saw which weighed three pound and two ounces. Good pike and trout we also caught besides. May 24th. About ten o'clock this evening my servant Will came home rather intoxicated, and was exceedingly impudent and saucy toward me. 
said he would leave me at midsummer or to-morrow morning etc will's behavior made me very uneasy i gave him notice that now he should go away at midsummer may twenty fifth mr and mrs pounsett and bill breakfast dined supped etc here cousin lewis breakfast with us and then took his leave of us as he must now go to beeston mr pounsett went with him so far as lensway bridge bill went with cousin lewis as far as ellum on foot i gave cousin lewis going away ten shillings sixpence cousin lewis could not help crying on going away on june second the diarist bill and mr and mrs pounsett and will the servant made an expedition to yarmouth staying at norwich on the way june fourth we all breakfast and dined at the wrestlers after breakfast we took a walk about yarmouth called at bolter's shop in the market-place and there i bought a fine doll for jenny's little maid paid for it five shillings for a dram bottle covered with leather paid two shillings for a silk purse paid three shillings for a turn screw and picker for a gun paid one shilling jenny bought a good many little things for her girl bolter is a very civil man and a quaker he is also an aquarian and has a good many curiosities as well as medals he showed me a complete set of copper coins of the twelve caesars he offered to sell them to me for ten guineas but i could not spare the money we went also and saw the church and churchyard this being the king's birthday yarmouth was quite alive the cambridgeshire militia was there and were exercised bells ringing the flags from the ships in the sea and on the quay all flying at eleven o'clock i drove my sister down to the front in a yarmouth coach and there stayed till after the cannon were all fired mr pounsett and bill walked down to the fort at one o'clock the cannons on the fort were all fired i fired the first cannon on it of six pounders and the second and i likewise fired two of the largest cannons twenty-four pounders they made a prodigious report i stayed upon the fort all the time they were fired bill let off four cannon and will let off one of the largest several women were there mr pounsett and jenny walked about a mile from the fort during the firing of the cannon we eat and drank at the fort and i paid and gave seven shillings sixpence we returned at three to the wrestlers and there dined they went back to weston by coach and chaise which they reached at ten p m we were all pretty much fatigued before we got to bed which was not till one in the morning we had a couple of fowls roasted for supper after we got home and we eat very hearty of them indeed june fifth mr custance senior of ringland called on me this morn caught me in a very great disabelle and long beard he stayed with me about half an hour talked exceedingly civil and obliging and behaved very polite this is mr john custance my squire of whom and of whose life we shall hear frequently hereafter he was born in seventeen forty nine the son of hambleton custance and grandson of john custance who had purchased the weston property in seventeen twenty six mr custance's wife was the second daughter of sir william beauchamp proctor created a baronet in seventeen forty five and she was therefore sister-in-law of sir edmund bacon kinsman of the owner of earlham see page two hundred thirty three a name which now conjures up charming pictures of later gurneys through the pious art of mr percy lubbock the custances as will appear from the diary had numerous children seven of whom survived squire custance's pleasant character and the charm of his wife are revealed as the diary proceeds the squire it is amusing to know maintained some touch with the great world of london as being a gentleman of the privy chamber note burke's landed gentry nineteen twenty one under custance june ninth the diarist has to go to norwich on business in the evening about nine o'clock there was a great riot upon the castle hill between the officers of the western battalion of the norfolk militia and the common soldiers and mob owing to the officers refusing to pay their men a guinea apiece as they go to-morrow towards the place of their encampment several of them refusing to go without it 
and would not resume their arms after roll-calling for which they were put into the guard-room and the mob insisting upon having them out which occasioned a great riot the mob threw stones and some of the soldiers running their bayonets at the mob and wounded them some of each side were hurt but not mortally wounded or killed it lasted till midnight and the officers behaved very well in it i was at the place for some time till near eleven o'clock to odd things this evening paid three shillings sixpence i did not go to bed till after twelve and then only pulled off my coat and waistcoat and shoes as there was such a bustle and noise all night and riot expected again june tenth i got up this morning at four o'clock and went and saw the militia march out of town a great mob was present and a great riot expected but they went away at five and tolerably quiet june fourteenth i breakfast dined supped and slept again at home mr pounsett jenny and bill breakfast etc etc here again i read prayers and preached this morn at weston mr custance senior and his lady were at church and came in a coach and four june thirtieth i breakfast supped and slept again at home jenny breakfast supped and slept here again mr pounsett and bill breakfast dined etc etc here again at one o'clock myself and sister took a ride to mr duquesne it being his rotation and there we dined and spent a very agreeable day with him and mr holcomb from pembroke a friend of mr duquesne's and is a very merry cheerful and sensible man st john priest mr and mrs howes mr and mrs payne howes daughter mr and miss don and mr bottom mr holcomb is also a very musical man plays well on the violin and therefore we had a concert also we had for dinner some mackerel a piece of beef boiled three fowls roasted and bacon with tarts etc we had after dinner vast quantities of strawberries at quadrille this afternoon lost one shilling mrs howes appeared in her new silk sack to-day it was very handsome and of lilac color my sister and self did not return to weston till after nine to a poor old man eighty years old gave sixpence july sixth in the afternoon about five o'clock mr pounsett and sister took leave of weston and set off in lensway chaise for norwich in which i went with them to norwich and had my mare led there by will bill also rode the little mare with us to norwich we saw mr duquesne as soon as we got there he had bespoke two places in the coach for jenny and mr p jenny mr pounsett and bill drank coffee at the king's head this evening and afterwards went to mr baker's shop haberdasher in the market-place and bought some trifling things for what i bought paid five shillings mr duquesne myself mr pounsett jenny and bill went to the angel inn in the market-place from whence the coach goes out and there we all supped and stayed till twelve o'clock the time the coach sets forth for london and then mr duquesne jenny and mr pounsett got into the coach after taking leave and went off for london pray god they might all have a good and safe journey bill and myself being rather low after took a walk for about an hour over the city and then went to the king's head and went to bed there at the angel for bill and myself i paid five shillings my poor dear sister shook like an aspen leaf going away she never went in a stage coach before in her life july twenty ninth reported to-day that the english and french fleets had engaged and b the english is reported to have beat the french fleet to the purpose note one see pages two hundred and forty and forty one footnote august seventeenth begun shearing my wheat this morning and gave the shearers according to the norfolk custom as under a good breakfast at eleven o'clock plum cakes with caraway seeds in them and some liquor a good dinner with plum puddings and at four beer again and b the above are called elevens and fours only ben and will my shearers of wheat before the dew is off in the morn they mow oats my wheat this year not above four acres they shear with sickles instead of reap-hooks the form of them like a reap-hook but the edge of it like a saw 
and they do exceeding well. Will brewed this morning a barrel of ale before he went shearing wheat at twelve o'clock. August 18th. I buried poor Miss Rose this evening at Weston, aged twenty years. It was a very pretty, decent funeral. But James Smith, the clerk, made me wait in performing the office at the grave near a quarter of an hour, the grave not being long enough a good deal. It was a very great interruption. I gave it to James afterwards. I had a hat-band and a pair of gloves sent me. I was quite low this evening. August 25th. Ben went to help Stephen Andrews' men at harvest, came home in the evening in liquor, and at eleven o'clock, after I got up to my room to go to bed, I heard my little puppy cry much, and therefore I went down to see what was the matter with him, and he had got his head between the pails by the garden gate, and could not get back again. I released him and carried him towards the back door, and there I saw a light burning in Ben's room. Upon that I walked up into his room, and there saw him laying flat upon his back on the bed, asleep with his clothes on, and the candle burning on the table. I waked him, made him put out the candle, and talked with him a little on it, but not much as he was not in a capacity of answering but little. I was very uneasy to see matters go on so badly. August 26th. Mr. Baldwin called on us this morning, and talked with us concerning a midshipman's place for Bill, and desired us to drink a dish of tea with him in the afternoon, which we promised him. In the afternoon took a walk with Bill to Mr. Baldwin's at Ling, and there drank a dish of tea with him, Miss Virtue Baldwin, Mr. Hammerton, Dr. Neal. Had a good deal of chat with Mr. Hammerton about Bill. Bill is to go to London when Mr. Hammerton goes, which will be very soon, to show himself to a captain of a ship, and that Mr. Hammerton will use all his interest for him. I have been most uneasy and most unhappy all day about one thing or another. When Bill goes away I shall have no one to converse with, quite without a friend. The entry for this day has been much crossed out, I suspect by some early Victorian great-niece of the diarist, but from such parts as are decipherable, taken in conjunction with later entries, I gather that the diarist's maid, Suki, confesses to him that she is with child by one Humphrey. Bill also had been causing him anxiety for some time. Again, the diaries have been deleted, but portions are just decipherable, apparently by paying too great attentions to the fair sex. The combination of anxieties, and it is clear the diarist was much attached to his nephew, sufficiently accounts for the depressed conclusion of this day's entry. August 28th. The diarist and Bill visit Mr. Hammerton. We sat and talked a good deal about Bill's proceeding with regard to the Navy. Mr. Hammerton said that he would do what he could, and would advance him money to rig himself out, if he succeeds, upon my promise of paying him again soon. It was so friendly in Mr. Hammerton that I could not but comply in so critical an affair. Bill is therefore to go in the London coach on Sunday evening, and wait at the Swan and two necks in Lads Lane, London, till Mr. Hammerton calls on him which he says will be either Monday evening or Tuesday morning early. Mr. Hammerton rides. Very low and ill with all, especially going to bed. Suki went before Justice Buxton today with her information, question mark, to swear to the father of the child she is big with. I had a note from Mr. Buxton which Suki brought to desire the parish officer, the overseer, to come with her, and then he would take her information. August 29th. My maid, Suki, went with Mr. Palmer to Mr. Justice Buxton, and he granted a warrant to take up Humphrey. August 30th. I read prayers and preached this afternoon at Weston. Gave my nephew to go to London this morning five pounds five shillings. About eight in the evening I took a ride with Bill to Norwich, and there took a place in the coach for him. We drank coffee at the King's Head this evening. We supped at the Angel Inn, as the London machine set out from thence at twelve at night. I stayed with Bill till twelve, saw him safe into the machine, and then I went to the King's Head, where I slept but very little. At the Angel this evening I paid and gave seven shillings. I was very restless and uneasy all night. 
September 3rd, I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. I told Suki this morning my opinion of her respecting the late affair that has happened to her. September 7th, I sent a note this morning to Mr. Custance of Ringland to let him know that I would dine with him today, but he was gone to dine with Sir Edmund Bacon at Earlham. Note, Earlham has recently been made famous by Mr. Percy Lubbock's book of that title. A long history of the two manors there will be found in Volume 4 of Bloomfield's History of Norfolk, pages 509 to 516, edition of 1806. The property appears to have passed to the Bacon family in the second half of the seventeenth century through the marriage of Elizabeth Waller to Francis Bacon, Esquire, a descendant of Queen Elizabeth's Lord Keeper, Sir Nicholas Bacon. Edward Bacon, Esquire, is stated by Bloomfield in 1745 to be the present lord and patron who hath his seat here. Edward Bacon was for many years M.P. for Norwich, returned in 1754, 1761, 1768, 1744, and 1780, and recorder. Sir Edmund Bacon had succeeded to the premier baronetcy of England, 1611, and another of 1627, creation on March 26, 1773. He married on January 29, 1778, and first daughter of Sir William Beauchamp Proctor, first baronet, 1745, and died September 5, 1820. See Cockaine's Baronetage under Bacon. His wife was Mrs. Custon's sister. It will be remembered that Mr. Lubbock describes Earlham as being leased to the Gurneys toward the end of the eighteenth century, in 1786, to be precise. The vicars of Earlham date back to 1267, until the Reformation they were presented by the nuns of Caro. I took a ride in the evening to Ling, called at Mr. Baldwin's and Mr. Hammerton's, and returned home again. About ten at night my nephew returned from London, and he brought me a letter from Mr. Hamilton, who informs me that Captain Allen of the Chatham, a fifty-gun ship, will take my nephew, if he is properly and handsomely equipped, which will cost about sixty pounds. He must therefore go into the West and try his friends. For my part I cannot do it for him, I am sure. September 8th. Bill breakfast, dined, and spent the afternoon here, and in the evening set off from my house for the west to consult his friends on the affair, and try what they will do. I gave him to bear his expenses three pounds thirteen shillings sixpence. He went to Norwich on horseback, and my servant Ben went with him, and then Ben returned about eleven o'clock. He would not get a place in the inside of the London coach, and therefore obliged to ride in the outside. He goes from London in the From, or some other coach from the west. He is greatly fatigued already. September 9th. I breakfast and slept again at home. Sent a letter this morning by Mr. Burton to Mr. Priests at Repham, respecting my servant boy, whom I take out of charity, whether I am to pay for him according to the late act relating to servants. Note. The tax on men servants was imposed in 1777 by Lord North when compelled to find fresh revenue of nearly 250,000 pounds. He borrowed the idea from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, and Adam Smith had borrowed it from Holland, where the tax was in vogue. In 1785, Pitt extended the tax to maid servants, despite many jokes of a free description, as Stephen Dowell observes. C. Dowell's History of Taxation, etc., Volume 2, pages 169 to 170, and 190 and 191. Mr. Priest is one of the commissioners, and there is a meeting this day at Repham concerning that and the duty on houses. To Mr. Burroughs, harvest men gave one shilling. I took a ride to Ringland about two o'clock, and there dined, spent the afternoon, and supped and spent the evening at Mr. Constance's with him, his wife, and an old maiden lady by name Miss Rush. I spent a most agreeable day there, and was very merry. Mrs. Custance and Self played at backgammon together. Mr. and Mrs. Custance are very agreeable people indeed, and both behaved exceedingly polite and civil to me. 
I there saw an instrument which Mrs. Custance played on that I never saw or heard of before. It is called Staccardo Pastoral. It is very soft music indeed. It is several long pieces of glass laid in order in a case, resting on each end of every piece of glass, and is played in the middle parts of the glass by two little sticks with knobs at the end of them striking the glass. It is a very small instrument and looks when covered like a working box for ladies. I also saw the prettiest working box with all sorts of things in it for the ladies to carry with them when they go abroad, about as big again as a tea-chest that I ever saw in my life. It could not cost less than five guineas. We had for dinner some common fish, a leg of mutton roasted, and a baked pudding the first course, and a roast duck, a meat pie, eggs and tarts the second. For supper we had a brace of partridges roasted, some cold tongue, potatoes in shells, and tarts. I returned to Weston about one half past ten o'clock. To servants at Ringland, two, gave two shillings. Mr. Custance also gave me to carry home a brace of partridges, which my servant Will brought home. They keep six men servants and four maids. October 3rd. Had a letter this evening from my sister Pounset and another from Mr. Pounset, both enclosed in a frank. Had another from Bill from London to desire me to send him a ten-pound bill, but cannot. He has got, however, from his friends fifty pounds. October 5th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Mr. Palmer called on me this morning, and I had a long chat with him about Suki, also about the highways, and lastly about Methodists. To Mr. Carey, for things from Norwich, etc., paid eight shillings fourpence. About eleven o'clock at night, just as I was going to bed, my nephew William Woodford came to my house on foot. He came this evening in the Norwich coach from London. He was much disappointed at London on hearing that the Chatham was sailed, and therefore prevented going on board her. He slept at my house, but all the folks were gone to bed, and he obliged to sleep without any sheets. The ship was sailed about a week. They kept him in the country so long about raising fifty pounds that occasioned his disappointment. Three weeks there. October 10th. I went to East Tuttenham and read prayers and preached a charity sermon for Duquesne there. A Mr. and Mrs. Reavens, by will, gave some land to the poor of that place, and likewise money for a sermon to be preached as on this day for ever. I had not above ten people at church there to-day. Due to me from Duquesne for preaching for him at Honningham, fourteen sermons at ten shillings sixpence each, seven pounds seven shillings. October 14th, paid my servant maid Suki Boxley this morning a year's wage due October 10th, the sum of four pounds. Gave to her besides her wages, as going away, four shillings. I sent Carrie's cart with one of my horses by Ben to Little Melton, about four miles beyond Easton, after my new maid this afternoon, and she returned about six o'clock. Her name is Elizabeth Caxton, about forty years of age, but how she will do I know not as yet, but her wages are five pounds fifteen shillings sixpence per annum. But out of that she is to find herself in tea and sugar. She is not the most engaging, I must confess, by her first appearance that she makes. My other maid came to me also this evening. Her name is Anne Lillistone of Lenswade Bridge, about eighteen years of age, but very plain. However, I like her better than the other at the first sight. I am to give her two pounds per annum, and to make her an allowance to find herself in tea and sugar. Suki this evening left us, but in tears, most sad. October twenty-ninth, myself and Bill took a ride about noon to Mr. Baldwin's at Ling, and there dined, spent the afternoon, supped, and spent the evening and stayed till after one in the morn. We were very merry and very agreeable there. We had for dinner a dish of fish, some boiled fowls, some bacon, a tongue boiled, a leg of mutton roasted, some oysters, mince pies, and syllabubs. We had for supper fried herrings, hash, mutton, cold tongue, mince pies, and syllabubs, and stewed pears. 
Mrs. Hamerton, Mr. and Mrs. Baldwin, Miss Virtue, and Miss Nancy Baldwin and Mr. Shute, a young man ensign in the guards, and a near relation of Mrs. Baldwin, and whose father lives near Oxford, at a place called Shotover. We played at cards both before and after supper, at which I lost the most in all about nine shillings. We did not get to Weston till two in the morning, and did not get to bed till near four o'clock. November 6. This morning I had some suspicion that Bill was concerned with my maid Nancy, and also that she appeared to me to be with child. I was uneasy. But the truth will appear ere long, if so. Suki, my late maid, was at my house all day to-day to show Nan to make butter and to help in ironing. November 10. Had a letter this evening from Sister Pounsett with a bank bill in it of ten pounds had a letter also from james lewis to petition my assistance he having lately broke his left arm put some peas into ground in my walled garden november thirteenth the diarist and bill go to norwich for the day i supped and spent the evening with mr francis senior his son and daughter and family are at sam bill was to have been at mr francis's this evening but i apprehend he was after some of the town ladies after I came from Mr. Francis's I took a walk in pursuit of Bill, but he was got to the inn. November 21st. I told my maid Betty this morning that the other maid Nanny looked so big about the waist that I was afraid she was with child, but Betty told me she thought not, but would soon inform me if it is so. November 23rd. I told Bill this morning that I should have nothing more to say to him or do for him, and I gave him his money that he desired me to keep for him. He was very low on the occasion, and cried much. November 26th. He visits Mr. Duquesne with his servant. As we came back it was stormy and dark, and as we came out of the lane that goes to Duquesne's upon the turnpike on the right hand, just by the direction post, we could perceive a black horse standing still against the hedge, but could not discover any man upon it but as we got into the wood will said he heard the horse move as if coming after us but we jogged on and thank god got home very safe and undisturbed it was between eleven and twelve at night it had rather a suspicious appearance i thought november twenty eighth bad news upon the papers this evening as the french spaniards americans and the dutch are all against us november twenty ninth I read prayers and preached this morning at Weston. I had notice given in church this morning for my parishioners to meet at my house on Tuesday next and pay their respective dues for tithe. Mr. Hammerton sent a letter to Bill this afternoon, and in it one from a Mr. Toolman, agent for the Chatham, to Mr. Hammerton, to inform him that the Chatham would be at Sheerness the ensuing week, and that Bill would set out to meet her there. Bill went down immediately to Ling to Mr. Hammerton, and stayed there till near eight o'clock. He is to go off the ensuing week, which I am glad of. December 7th. About eight this afternoon I went to Norwich with my nephew, who goes in the London machine this night, on his sea expedition, which, if he does not succeed in on board the Chatham, is not to return here, but go into the West and get into a Bristol privateer. Mrs. Hammerton sent up a bottle of ketchup to be carried to her son, but we could not carry it. I put up my horses at the King's Head and slept there. We drank tea at the King's Head this evening, and we supped together at the Angel Inn in the coffee-room there, from whence the coach sets off. I stayed there till the coach went off, which was exactly at twelve at night. I saw Bill safe into the coach, and then returned to my inn to sleep. Bill set off in tolerable good spirits. I gave him to spend between young Hammerton and self, as we could not carry the ketchup, ten shillings sixpence. Gave to Bill, besides, for himself, one pound one shilling. My servant Will went with us to Norwich, and carried behind him two very fine turkey cocks, which went in the coach, and they were presents from me to Mr. Toolman and Mr. Charles Hammerton. Mr. Toolman is agent to the Chatham, and Mr. Hammerton is brother to Mr. Hammerton of Ling, 
and who behaved particularly civil to Bill when last in London, for there he slept, etc. December 8th. I breakfast and slept again at the King's Head. I went to Mr. Priest's, where I dined and spent the afternoon with him, his wife, Miss Fanny Priest, their daughter, who is but just alive, their son John, Mr. Priest of Repham, and daughter Rebecca. I paid Mr. Priest for wine and rum six pounds thirteen shillings. We had for dinner some Norfolk dumplings and a goose, a very poor dinner for so many of us, I think. The two priests and myself went to the Castle Hill in the afternoon to see the main satire, which was nothing more than a large monkey. I gave there sixpence. It did not answer our expectations at all. December 19th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. I shot a rook and a jackdaw at one shot this morning, and I believe fifty yards from me. I had a long letter from my sister, Pounset, this evening. Admiral Keppel and Sir Hugh Palliser, two of our chief admirals, have had a grand quarrel, and are both to have a court-martial set upon them soon. Note, the quarrel between Sir Hugh Palliser, 1723-1796, and Admiral Keppel, 1725-1786, arose out of the indecisive action in the channel of July 24th, 27th, 1778, between the French and British fleets, Keppel was in command and Palliser in second command. It appears that Palliser disobeyed an order of Keppel's at a vital moment, so the French fleet got away. Keppel honorably but unwisely suppressed any official report of Palliser's insubordination, but the facts leaked out, and Palliser, who hated Keppel, Keppel was a Whig and Palliser a Tory, urged his friend, Lord Sandwich, see pages 249-250, to have Keppel court-martialed. Keppel was charged with every kind of inefficiency and even cowardice by his subordinate. The court-martial was held, and resulted, February 11, 1779, in a triumphant vindication of Keppel. The popular feeling was all on Keppel's side, and the overjoyed mob burnt Palliser's house in Pall Mall and tore down the Admiralty gates. London was illuminated for two nights and Keppel's head was painted on the signs of country inns, where it is to be seen to this day. See notes of Keppel and Palliser in D.N.B. and Lecky's History of England in the Eighteenth Century, Volume 4, pages 93-94. December 23rd. Mr. Duquesne, Mr. and Mrs. Howes, Mr. Bonham, Mrs. Davy and children Betsy and Nunn, Mr. and Mrs. Don, and their cousin, a little boy by name Charles Dunn of London, dined and spent the afternoon with me, being my rotation, and all but Mr. Duquesne supped and spent the whole night with me, being very dark and some falling rain. Mr. Bottom, myself, and Mr. Don sat up the whole night and played at cards till six in the morning. Mr. and Mrs. Howe went to bed in my bedroom about two in the morning. Miss Don, Betsy, and Nun Davis slept together in the yellow room. Mr. Don's nephew slept in Will's room with Mr. Don's man, Charles. All my folks sat up. About six in the morning we serenaded the folks that were abed on the Haute boy. Mr. Duquesne went home about ten o'clock. I did all I could to prevail on him to stay, but could not. I gave them for dinner three fowls boiled, part of a ham, the major part of which ham was entirely eat out by the flies getting into it, a tongue boiled, a leg of mutton roasted, and an excellent currant pudding. I gave them for supper a couple of rabbits smothered in onions, some hash mutton, and some roasted potatoes. We were exceeding merry, indeed, all the night. I believe at cards that I lost about two shillings sixpence. December 26. Bad news from Oxford on the paper this evening, viz. that on December 18th a terrible fire broke out in Queen's College at three in the morning, and entirely destroyed the west wing of the new quadrangle with the provost's buildings, and burnt quite to ground. I am very sorry for the sad misfortune. December 27th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. I read prayers and administered the high sacrament this morning at Weston. Mr. and Mrs. Constance of Ringland at church and at the sacrament. 
as mr and mrs custance were going to see their brother mr press custance after church they took me up in their coach and brought me home and they came into my house and warmed themselves and stayed one quarter of an hour j smith my clerk harry dunnell and my late maid suki all dined with our folks in the kitchen i had part of a rump of beef boiled and a turkey roasted i sent harry dunnell's wife a dinner to-day i was rather dull being quite alone december thirtieth mr and mrs howes and mrs potter dined and spent the afternoon with me and stayed till eight in the evening i gave them for dinner a piece of boiled beef and a plain suet pudding and a fine turkey roasted mason a sparum came to my house with his ten bells this afternoon and played before my company and they were as well pleased as children on hearing them end of section twenty one seventeen seventy eight section twenty two of the diary of a country parson by james woodford read by john greenman this librivox recording is in the public domain seventeen seventy nine january first i breakfast dined supped and slept again at home this morning very early about one o'clock a most dreadful storm of wind with hail and snow happened here and the wind did not quite abate till the evening a little before two o'clock i got up my bedstead rocking under me and never in my life that i know of did i remember the wind so high or of so long continuance i expected every moment that some part or other of my house must have been blown down but blessed be god the whole stood only a few tiles displaced my servants also perceived their bedsteads to shake thanks be to god that none of my people or self were hurt my chancellor received great damage as did my barn the leads from my chancel were almost all blown off with some parts of the roof the northwest window blown in and smashed all to pieces the east window also damaged but not greatly the north window leads on to the top of the church also some of them blown up and ruffled besides two windows injured the clay on the north end of my barn blown in and the west side of the roof the thatch most all blown away leaving many holes in it the damage sustained by me will amount i suppose to fifty pounds if not more however i thank god no lives were lost that i hear of and i hope not mr shadowlow's barn michael andrews with many others all blown down numbers of trees torn up by the roots in many places in the evening the wind abated and was quite calm when i went to bed about eleven o'clock since what happened this morning i prolonged the letter that i designed to send to my sister Ponset to relate what had happened here by the storm and this evening sent it to her by mr carey a smart frost this evening as the year begins rather unfortunate to me hope the other parts of it will be as propitious to me it appears from subsequent entries that so badly had the church been damaged by the storm that no services could be held till february nineteenth by which date the necessary repairs to the chancel roof had been completed january third i sent will to mr hammerton's at ling this afternoon to inquire after bill and by a letter received there bill has altered his mind n b bill is gone into somerset and does not intend going into the chatham january sixteenth a sad gang of villains that infested these parts of ten in number apprehended and sent to the castle january eighteenth this being the queen's birthday about one o'clock i fired off my blunderbuss once on the occasion it had two tops of powder put in with paper upon it to my maid betty for one couple of rabbits eightpence january twenty first i breakfast dined supped and slept again at home poor james pratt died this afternoon in the smallpox in the natural way he never could be prevailed upon to be inoculated he has left a wife just ready to be brought to bed with six more small children pray god send comfort to the poor widow and family january twenty second he spends the day at mr baldwin's and meets mr hammerton 
Mr. Hamerton and I had some talk about my nephew. He said that he believed him to be a very unsteady man, and that he was very desirous and eager after the Chatham before she returned, and that when she did, he altered his mind, forsook her, and fled into the West. Mr. H. told me, also, that the captain had kept a place open entirely for him, and that he would have been very soon promoted. The captain was much displeased as well as Mr. Hamerton, who had both been very kind to him, and did all they could for him. He will never, I believe, turn out very well anywhere, and his parents, whatever they may promise, will do nothing. His father had wrote a letter to him, to let him know that he would get a lieutenancy of marines for him, that his uncle Thomas Woodford had promised to speak to my lord Guilford, note, Francis North, 1st Earl of Guilford, 1704-1790. He was father of the famous Lord North, Prime Minister, though he himself asserted that there was no such thing in the British Constitution. From 1770 to 1782, Lord Guilford was not a remarkable man in any way, but he was a great favorite at court of George III and Queen Charlotte, and therefore very influential. See D. N. B. Speak to my Lord Guilford for him about the same. I wish my head might never ache before that time. January 25th. Busy this morning in cleaning my jack, and did it completely. My stomach rather sick this evening. Mince pie rose oft. January 26th. Rotation day at Mr. Howe's. Just as the company was gone, Mrs. Howes attacked Mr. Howes about putting down the chaise, and she talked very roughly to him, and strutted about the room. It was rather too much in her. I did not stay long to hear it, but soon decamped, and was at home before ten. February 6th, at Norwich, I went to Mr. Priest's, and Mr. Priest, uh, Mr. Furman, and myself went to see a remarkable large pig, which even exceeded our idea of him. He is said to weigh fifty stone, is nine foot from the tip of his tail to the top of his snout in length, and four foot high when standing. He is obliged to be helped up when down. I never saw such a creature in my life. February 9th. I breakfast and slept again at home. At one o'clock took a ride to Ling and dined, spent the afternoon, supped and spent the evening, and stayed till after three this morning at Mr. Hammerton's with him and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Baldwin, and Miss Nancy. Mr. Lloyd and his wife of Bellow dined and spent the afternoon, and stayed till near eight in the evening with us at Mr. Hammerton's. We had for dinner a leg of mutton boiled, and capers, three fowls roasted, and a tongue, a plain pudding, custards, tarts, and syllabubs. For supper a hot giblet pie, cold fowl, and tongue, potted beef, tarts, custards, and syllabubs. Mr. Lloyd is a very agreeable man, sings exceeding well, keeps a pack of hounds, is a captain in the militia, a justice of peace, and of good fortunes. At Loo this evening, Nancy Baldwin and myself going partners, we won between us five shillings. I took two shillings and gave Nancy the rest. We were very merry indeed, all the whole time. I gave to Mr. Hammerton's servants two shillings. I did not get to bed till after four this morning. My maid, Nanny, walked downstairs to the kitchen door naked this night in her sleep. February 13th. By this day's paper an account is given that the trial of Admiral Keppel is over, and that the court had declared and said that the court are unanimously of opinion that the charge of Sir Hugh Palliser is malicious and ill-founded, and that Admiral Keppel behaved as became a judicious, brave, and experienced officer. This court, therefore, do honorably acquit him. At the receipt of the above intelligence, a general illumination took place throughout London and Westminster, accompanied by ringing of bells, firing of cannon, etc. Note, see pages 240-241, footnote. I gave the people at work for me at church a pretty severe jobation this oft, finding them at the inn. February 17th. 
I lent my servant Will Coleman this evening to subscribe towards raising a man for the militia if he should be drawn, as there are many more that have done the same at ten shillings sixpence each. One pound, one shilling. February 27th. Never known scarce such fine weather at this season of the year, and of so long continuance, ever since almost the storm of the first of January. It was like June today thanks to god for such glorious weather march fifth sent a letter this evening to dr oglander warden of the new college to petition him for assistance in repairing my chancel with the society march fifteenth i spent some part of the morning at church and my new seat and a very handsome one made of deal was finished this day in putting up in the chancel and made by mr pyle of hockering but i found most of the deal to do it with the old seat that was is converted into a servant's seat, and they both look neat and will completely so when painted. March 23rd. I breakfast and slept again at home. Memorandum. In shaving my face this morning I happened to cut one of my moles which bled much, and happening also to kill a small moth that was flying about, I applied it to my hand. It instantaneously stopped the bleeding march thirtieth never known perhaps such a long continuance of dry and fine weather we have had no settled rain for any time for almost two years last past march thirty first i breakfast and slept again at home i took a ride about two o'clock to mr custance's at ringland and there dined supped spent the evening with him and his wife and lady bacon we had for the first course a dish of fish, a leg of mutton roasted, and some ham and chicken tarts. The second course, an orange apple pudding, some asparagus, veal collets, syllabubs, and jelly. Soon after dinner was obliged to return to Overton to bury old Mrs. Pegg at five o'clock, which I did, aged seventy-three. I had a hat-band and a pair of white kid gloves. I returned to Mr. Custance's by tea-time, and after tea we got to cards, to whist, at which I lost one shilling sixpence. Mrs. Custance and self attacked Lady Bacon and Mr. Custance. I spent a very agreeable day there today. We had some Parmesan cheese after dinner, and supper, of which I eat uh, very hearty, and like it exceedingly. I gave to one of Mr. Custance's servants one shilling. I got home about eleven at night. April 3rd. Quite a summer's day and exceeding fair. Had a letter this evening from my sister Pounsett. Had another from Dr. Oglander, warden of New College, Oxford, in answer to mine, and very satisfactory it was. Five poor unhappy young men were hanged this day at Norwich for divers misdemeanors. At the last assizes they were condemned. Bell, Body, Bridges, partridge and griffin none of them but what were quite young but villains april eleventh between eleven and twelve o'clock this morning i went to church and publicly christened mr custance's child of ringland it had been privately named before and the name of it was hamilton thomas the gossips were sir edmund bacon proxy for sir thomas beauchamp Mr. Press Custance and Lady Bacon, Mr. and Mrs. Custance also present at the ceremony. There were coaches at church. Mr. Custance immediately after the ceremony came to me and desired me to accept a small present. It was wrapped up in a piece of white paper, very neat, and on opening it I found it contained nothing less than the sum of four pounds four shillings. He gave the clerk also ten shillings sixpence. April 15th. I breakfast and supped again at home. About two o'clock took a ride to Mr. Custance's at Ringland, and there dined, spent the afternoon, supped, and spent the evening with him and Mrs. Custance and Lady Bacon. Sir Edmund Bacon came to us just at supper-time, and he supped, etc., there. Sir Edmund was rather merry, and was very cheerful. He is quite a young man and personable, but has an odd cast with his eyes rather cross-sighted. I spent a very agreeable day at Ringland. We had for dinner a breast of veal, ragoud, a fine piece of boiled beef, a pigeon pie, custards, 
puffs and some lemon cream for supper a young chicken cold tongue etc at whist this evening mrs custance and myself against lady bacon and mr custance and i lost two shillings it was astonishing hot and sultry most part of the day and in the evening a good deal of lightning most uncommon weather for the time of the year the thermometer as high as at any time last year i got home about eleven at night april seventeenth i breakfast dined supped and slept again at home a miss ray mistress to lord sandwich note john montague fourth earl of sandwich seventeen eighteen to seventeen ninety two after a varied career as general politician and ambassador became first lord of the admiralty in lord north's ministry on january twelfth seventeen seventy one a post which he held till lord north's fall from power in seventeen eighty two his tenure of office synchronized with a deplorably corrupt and inefficient administration of the navy continuing throughout the american war he was nicknamed jemmy twitcher of beggar's opera fame as early as seventeen sixty three on account of his conduct against wilkes once his boon companion on the other hand he was the patron of the celebrated pioneer captain cook who named the sandwich islands after him sandwich's mistress miss martha ray had lived with him for sixteen years when she was murdered by the rev james hackman she was a good musician and the musical entertainments at hinchinbroke which the montagues bought from the cronwells in the seventeenth century were celebrated for their excellence c d n b also mr d a winstanley's the university of cambridge in the eighteenth century for an account of the famous contest between lord sandwich and lord hardwick for the stewardship of the university End of note. a miss ray mistress to lord sandwich was last week shot through the head as she was getting into her coach from the playhouse in london by one mr ackman a clergyman he was immediately taken into custody and will be hanged it is supposed it is thought that it was done through despair of love he immediately after shooting her discharged another pistol at his own head it grazed his forehead but did not kill him as some one pulled his arm a captain bruce also last week shot himself through the head but not immediately killed him he then fell on his sword which broke in his body a servant then got into the room a surgeon was sent for who dressed his wounds and put him to bed he then took a large knife not having dispatched himself and stabbed himself which also broke and that wound was dressed he then took a penknife and cut his throat and then expired soon he had not a great while ago married a woman of three thousand pounds per annum no reason assigned for it such things indeed are very dismal to read april eighteenth i read prayers and preached this morning at weston mr and mrs custance of ringland were at church and sat in my new seat in the chancel their new seat in the church not being finished as yet i gave mrs custance a fine flower a double stock april twenty eighth i took a ride to sparham and made a visit to the rev mr attle who behaved very complacent and civil though a visit so long due to him from me i drank a dish of coffee and one dish of tea there and returned home he has a noble house and his fields about him look exceeding neat and well he built the house himself and it cost him one thousand pounds between may fourth and may eighth the diarist and mr hall of winborough put into execution a scheme upon the northern coast of norfolk which had been some time talked of servant will went with them first they went to cromer famous for catching of crabs and lobsters next they went to clay and thence to wells and wells they spent the night at the royal standard kept by one smith a civil and obliging man and the day following got into a small boat and went to sea in it the diarist however did not enjoy himself though they went out but a little way as he was very near sick as was will and the wave so large that frightened me as i thought it dangerous from wells they went to houghton hall lord orford's note 
George Walpole, third Earl of Orford, 1730 to 1791, he was grandson of the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Walpole. Lord Orford's seat, the house and furniture the grandest I ever saw, and the pictures are supposed to be the best collection in Europe. After visiting Lynn Regis, Swaffham, and Durham, the party returned to their respective homes on May 8th, Mr. Hall to Winborough, and the diarist and Will to Weston. May 15th. Bled my three horses this morning, two quarts each. May 18th. Mr. Howes and wife and Mr. Davy, Mr. Bottom and his brother, and Mr. Duquesne all dined and spent the afternoon and part of the evening with us today. I gave them for dinner a dish of mackerel, three young chicken boiled, and some bacon, a neck of pork roasted, and a gooseberry pie hot. We laughed immoderately after dinner on Mrs. Howe's being sent to Coventry by us for an hour. What with laughing and eating, hot gooseberry pie brought on me the hiccups, with a violent pain in my stomach which lasted till I went to bed. At cards quadrille this evening, lost two shillings sixpence. May 21st. Sent a letter this evening by Carey to Dr. Oglander, warden of New College, with a bill of the expenses on the repairing of my church, in all, seventy-three pounds, ten shillings, eleven and a half pence. May 22nd. My boy Jack had another touch of the ague about noon. I gave him a dram of gin at the beginning of the fit, and pushed him headlong into one of my ponds, and ordered him to bed immediately, and he was better after it and had nothing of the cold fit after, but was very hot. May 27th, my maid Nanny, was taken very ill this evening with a dizziness in the head and a desire to vomit, but could not. Her straining to vomit brought on the hiccups, which continued very violent till after she got to bed. I gave her a dose of rhubarb going to bed. Ben was also very ill and in the same complaint about noon, but he vomited and was soon better. I gave Ben a good dose of rhubarb also, going to bed. May 31st. I breakfasted at home, and at six this morning set forth on my mare for the West Country, and took my man Will Coleman with me, who rode my great horse. The journey occupied six days, and was uneventful. On the 31st they slept at Barton Mills, at the Bull, on June 1st at Royston, at the Talbot, as they passed through Newmarket in the morning they saw Lord Orford, just going out a-hawking, on June 2nd at Aylesboro at the George Inn, on June 3rd at Newbury at the Pelican, on June 4th at Amesbury at the New Inn, and on June 5th they arrived at eight in the evening at Ansford, and I, thank God, found all my friends there hearty and well, and exceeding glad to see me. I supped and slept at Mr. Pounsett's, my horse is there also. My man Will Coleman supped and slept there also. The six days' journey cost the diarist in all six pounds, three shillings, three and a half pence, including the horses. For more than three months the diarist and Will stayed at Ansford, Mr. Duquesne taking the duty meanwhile at Weston. At Ansford we immediately get back into the old Somerset atmosphere, the days spent in a constant interchange of generous hospitality between the numerous relations and friends, in frequent fishing expeditions, occasional visiting of feasts and fairs, and jaunts further afield. Needless to say, the Lewises, father and son, were shabby as usual, turn up, having walked from Nottinghamshire, and live on their hospitable relations for some weeks. June 12th. Mr. James Clark, brother John's wife, and Nancy Woodford and sister Clark, dined, spent the afternoon, supped, and spent the evening with us. Richard Clark and wife and brother John spent the afternoon with us also, but was very disagreeable being drunk, and was going to fight with James Clark, and swore abominably. It was twelve o'clock before we got to bed, being so much disturbed, I pity his wife much. July 1st. About noon I walked down to Carry with Brother Hyes and read the London paper at the George Inn. I treated Brother Hyes with a pint of beer. I paid two and a half pence. After that I went to Richard Clark's and dined, spent the afternoon, supped and spent the evening there with him and his wife, James Clark, my brother John's wife, and 
Nancy Woodford, and my sister Pounsett. We had for dinner three fowls boiled and a pig's face, a haunch of venison roasted and sweet sauce, tarts and cheese cakes, and B. Not a bit of fat was there on the venison. Brother Hyes, Brother John, Juliana, Woodford, and Sister Clark supped and spent the evening with us. July 3rd. Brother Hyes complained of being very poor this afternoon. I therefore let him have one pound one shilling, for which I had of him an old family gold ring, which he is to have again when he can repay me. July 9th. I went a-fishing by myself this morning down to Wick Bridge, and angled from thence to Cole, and there I dined and spent the afternoon at Mr. Guppy's with him, his sister, and Mr. Pounsett. We had for dinner some bacon and beans, a shoulder of mutton, and currant pie. I caught three trout, the largest fourteen inches and a half long, which I caught with two grasshoppers and a small hook. Whilst I was a-fishing this morning, Bill Woodford came to me on horseback to take his leave of me, as he was then going off for Portsmouth to go aboard the Fortune Sloop of War, of twelve guns, and in the same capacity as he was to have went in the Chatham of fifty guns. The latter would have been much better, and he repents much of not going, but is now too late. I wished him well, but gave him nothing at all. To Mr. Guppy's maid, Sybil, for a poor woman in distress at Shepton Montague gave one shilling. To Mr. Guppy's man, to Ellis Coleman, gave one shilling. Sister Clark supped and spent the evening with us. July 19th. This being the bishop's visitation at Bruton today, I took my mare and rode over to see some of the clergy whom I have been long acquainted with. I went to the church, heard the prayers read by Mr. Hall, and heard also the visitation sermon preached by Mr. Wickham of Shepton Mallet, and after that I heard the bishop's charge to his clergy, which chiefly consisted of advising them to catechize the children publicly and to give them lectures on the same, recommending the late Metropolitans, Dr. Secker, note, Thomas Secker, 1693-1768, Archbishop of Canterbury, he was one of the best of the lesser-known archbishops, a man of great intellectual ability, the devoted friend of the great Bishop Butler, of wonderfully tolerant mind, sympathetic to Wesley, friendly with the dissenters, hostile to any persecution of the Jacobite Scottish clergy after the defeat of 1745, originally intended for the dissenting ministry, then temporarily turning from theological studies to medicine, he was made an M.D. of Leyden in 1721 for a brilliant medical thesis. He finally decided to enter Anglican orders. Through the stages of Country Parson and London Parson, he became successively Bishop of Bristol, Bishop of Oxford, finally entering Lambeth Palace in 1758. See the account of Archbishop Secker in Mr. A. W. Rowden's The Primates of the Four Georges, Murray, 1916, also D.N.B. End of note. The late Metropolitan, Dr. Secker's dissertations on the Catechism, and, lastly, of visiting the sick with an enconium on the King. I saw Will Bailey, little Mr. Hunt, Mr. Rag, Mr. Marsh, Mr. Rawkins, Mr. Wickham, Mr. Millard, Mr. Goldsborough, Mr. Thomas of Carey, etc., etc. The Bishop of Bath and Wells is Dr. Charles Moss. Note. Charles Moss, 1711 to 1802, bishop successively of St. David's and of Bath and Wells, nephew of Robert Moss, 1666 to 1729, dean of Ely and father of Charles Moss, 1763 to 1811, bishop of Oxford. He was son of a Norfolk gentleman farmer and inherited a large fortune from his uncle, the dean. He was an amiable prelate and strongly supported Hannah Moore's educational activities in Somerset. Most of his considerable wealth he left to his son, upon whom he had already bestowed various promotions in the church. C. D. N. B. N. B. I stole a goose this morning from my sister White, and asked her to dine upon it to-morrow, and she is to know nothing of it. I told her I had a swan. Mr. White went to Sherburn Fair this morning. I lent him my great horse to go there. 
July 21st. I breakfasted and spent the morning at Ansford. About twelve o'clock I got into the Weymouth machine from Bath and set off by myself for Weymouth. There was only one man in it who was dressed as a gentleman and behaved as such. His name was Watson. We dined at Sherburne at the George, a shabby inn, and had a most miserable dinner, about two pound of boiled beef and an old tame rabbit. I paid for my dinner at Sherburne one shilling sixpence. We then went on to Dorchester, and there we had a bottle of the famous Dorchester beer, and very good it was. For the bottle of beer I paid myself sixpence. We got to Weymouth about eight o'clock, and there I supped and slept at the King's Head, kept by one Lauder, a very good inn and very civil pupil. To the coachman for my fare paid nine shillings sixpence, to the coachman for himself gave one shilling. Mr. Watson and self supped together, for my share paid two shillings. July 23rd. Mr. Watson, who came with me, I heard this afternoon, was a hairdresser from Bristol and dresses ladies' heads. Weymouth at present has but little company in it. For my dinner to-day and supper to-night, and lodging three nights, paid this evening to Mrs. Lauder, six shillings ninepence. July 27th. About eleven this morning I took a ride with my sister, who rode behind my servant, to South Cadbury, and there I left her at Mr. Slade's, where she dined, etc. I went afterwards on my mare by myself to Milburn Port, about five miles from South Cadbury, and there I dined and spent the afternoon at Mr. Lucas's, with him, his mother, and sister Chandler, and two young gentlemen. Lucas is just the same man as at New College. He has the vicarage of Milbourne Port, being fellow of Winton College. His mother and sister keep his house for him. He told me that his present income was about three hundred and fifty pound per annum. One of the young gentlemen that dined with us lives at Queen Camel, and is a clergyman, his name Charles. The other was a lad, and lately a chorister of New College. His name was Charles Marsh, and I remembered him there. Lucas was very glad to see me. At five left him. We had for dinner some boiled pork and beans, a couple of ducks roasted, and an apricot pudding. Going to Lucas's, I saw Jack Windham and his wife in a phaeton and pair, going from Corton to Cadbury, but was not near enough to speak to him. He has the living of Corton and resides there. He married a Miss Bowles of Salisbury, Canon Bowles' daughter. Jack Windham is a doctor of law. I returned to Cadbury about seven in the evening, stayed there half an hour, and returned with my sister to Ansford about nine o'clock. August 12th. I breakfasted, dined, supped, and slept again at Bath, whither he had gone on a jaunt on August 10th, visiting Bristol also. James Lewis and his son called on me this morning at Bath, but did not stay long. They were going for Nottingham. I did not give either of them anything at all. The Lewises had been at Ansford since July 11th, having walked from Nottingham. To a barber this morning of Bath gave sixpence. After breakfast and dressing, I took a walk, and near the parade met with my good old friend Dr. Penny, who was hearty and well. I walked with him to the bank and to the coffee-house, and the doctor, seeing a Miss Bliss walking by the coffee-house, he joined her and I saw nothing more of him afterwards at Bath. I called at the Three Inns, etc., but he was gone, at the Three Inns for some rum and water, paid threepence, for a pair of garters this morning paid one shilling, to some fish-hooks two dozen paid also two shillings, to two new pamphlets concerning a tithe cause paid six shillings. I went and saw the Abbey Church, which is kept very neat, and a great many monuments in it. At David's fruit shop this afternoon, for a melon paid two shillings sixpence. For three pounds of filberts, paid also one shilling fourpence. After tea this evening, I took a walk in the fields and met in my walk two girls, the eldest about seventeen, the other about fifteen, both common prostitutes, even at that early age. I gave them some good advice to consider the end of things. I gave them one shilling. I paid my bill this evening at the Christopher, as I intend going off early tomorrow morning, in all fourteen shillings sixpence. 
ringing etc at bath today being the prince's birthday august thirteenth i got up this morning about six o'clock and at seven got into the diligence for ansford to the chambermaid at bath gave one shilling sixpence waiter one shilling deputy waiter sixpence boot catch sixpence total two shillings a clergyman by name austin from the city of kilkenny in ireland went with me in the diligence from bath he being going to see a friend at weymouth he was a very good kind of man by his appearance he knew james lewis and his father very well he was a scholar of old mr lewis and he gave him a very high character but a very bad one of james lewis he told me that james lewis was one of the most wild turn that when a boy he shot another boy through the head but by accident that he had been a deserter to the french in the rebellion forty five and saved being shot by bringing back ten deserters with him that he had quite tired his friends in ireland and would do the same in england a common expression of james lewis's when in ireland was that his being was in england we breakfasted together at gannard's grave on some brandy and milk for which i paid sixpence at gannard's grave we took up two passengers one inside and one outside three passengers in the inside made it very disagreeable in so small a diligence i got to ansford about twelve and there i supped and slept at mr pounsett's gave the driver tom smith one shilling mr guppy mr thomas sister white and one john white of brinton who came with mr guppy dined etc here we had a fine young hare for dinner august nineteenth when i returned home from a fishing expedition i found the people at ansford etc in great consternation a report being spread by john burgey of castle carry that the french and spanish fleets were engaging at portsmouth that three of our line were sunk and that the spanish and french fleets consisted of more than sixty ships of the line and ours only forty ships that the stones in portsmouth street were taken up etc as it came from such authority i don't credit it at all john burgey said that he had it from a man who saw the engagement and saw also our three ships sink and that the sea looked on fire where the engagement was it frightened my sisters white and pounsett very much august twentieth in the evening i walked to south carry to old mrs penny's and there mr pounsett himself smoked a pipe with dr penny nothing true about the french as mentioned yesterday august twenty third i got up this morning between five and six and at six i took a ride and my servant with me to wells we got there about eight and there we breakfast at the goat kept by robin coleman's widow for my breakfast etc paid one shilling fourpence after breakfast i walked down to mr wickham's who lives close to the deanery and there saw mr and mrs wickham their son tom and his two sisters betty and fanny a mr skinner and son from richmond were there also mr and mrs wickham pressed me to dine with them i then went back to my inn got upon my mare and went on to cheddar eight miles from wells we got there about eleven o'clock put up my horse at the buck there and then will and myself walked to the cliffs to see them about one half mile from the inn and most grand appearance did they make we walked quite through them which could not be less than a mile they are supposed to be rent asunder by an earthquake some of the rocks i suppose are above three hundred feet perpendicular each side of the rocks exactly corresponds with one another like the teeth of a gin when extended it exceeded my expectation greatly indeed i set off from cheddar a quarter before two o'clock and we returned to wells by three i got off at mr wickham's and will had the horses to the goat and there he dined etc paid at cheddar for ourselves and horses one shilling fourpence i dined and spent the afternoon at mr wickham's with him his wife two daughters and son mr skinner and son and a clergyman by name purcell who lives on the public we had for dinner some boiled beef a fillet of veal roasted and a plum pudding mulberries and pears after dinner 
a mr cambridge and his two sisters from richmond called at mr wickham's in a chaise this afternoon being just returned from plymouth he informed us that plymouth and exeter were in great consternation about the french and spanish fleets who were on wednesday last about five leagues from plymouth they saw them very plain from the hill near plymouth and could distinctly tell the numbers of the ships and they amounted to only seventy-three sail instead of a hundred and three as reported mr cambridge saw an engagement between one of our ships by name of ardent of fifty guns captain bottler and three of the enemies and she was obliged to strike to them after an engagement of four hours and half it happened on tuesday last sir charles hardy not to be found a general engagement is daily expected between the fleets the entries of august nineteenth and twenty third bear vivid witness to the extraordinary peril the country was in in this summer of seventeen seventy nine john burgee was of course a mere purveyor of rumor but the actual danger was very great the french and spanish fleets had combined and entering the channel in august outnumbered the english fleet under sir charles hardy seventeen sixteen to seventeen eighty by practically two to one for the first time says lecky since sixteen ninety england saw a vast fleet commanding her seas and threatening and insulting her coasts invasion was almost hourly expected the danger appeared extreme the humiliation was intolerable and the letters of the most serious members of the opposition show that in their opinion the country had been conducted to the very brink of ruin fortunately however the hostile fleet was feebly commanded and very imperfectly equipped sickness raged violently in its crews and early in september as the season of the equinoctial gales was rapidly approaching it retired to brest where it remained inactive for several months a great panic and humiliation and the capture of a single ship of war of sixty-four guns were the sole fruits of the expedition note lecky's history of england in the eighteenth century volume four pages one hundred and eleven to one hundred and thirteen see also notice of hardy in d n b september sixth i breakfast dined supped and slept again at ansford nancy woodford dined and spent the afternoon with us i gave this morning to my sister ponset one pound one shilling to be laid out in something for her little maid to nancy hosey late my sister's maid for making some handkerchiefs for me etc gave her two shillings sixpence i gave her coming away being a pretty girl one kiss mr white james clark and mr pounsett and self walked up to ansford inn in the afternoon and smoked a pipe there on liquor etc we each paid one shilling dr rock an old schoolfellow of mine and mr wickham's son thomas came to ansford inn this evening in a whiskey and they were with us half an hour gave to james white and little ann white this evening ten shillings great firing of cannon heard at ansford this afternoon september eighth at nine this morning i took my leave of my friends leaving them in tears and was off for norfolk he and his servant sleep that night at salisbury i went and saw a hundred and fifty french prisoners this evening that are on their march to winchester september ninth I slept exceeding well last night, having a very good bed. I got up at six this morning, and saw the French prisoners march off for Winchester, accompanied by a troop of horse. After that I took a walk by myself to the camp about two miles south of Salisbury, and there breakfast at the camp coffee-house for officers, etc. All horse and camp there, six regiments in all. The camp made a very pretty appearance they proceed on their way and sleep at winchester september tenth i slept very sound last night having a very good bed i breakfast at the george winchester and after breakfast took a walk to the king's house and saw the french prisoners walked over the prison with a civil soldier i gave the soldier that went with me sixpence i saw also the one hundred and fifty french prisoners that came from stockbridge this morning delivered into prison 
Each of them had a new straw bed given him and a coarse hammock to lay it upon. There are now in the prison about 4,000, and it is said that the prison will hold 6,000 more. Many of the prisoners are supposed to be English, especially some of the boys who talk English very well. About noon we marched off from Winton. These references by the diarist to the cavalry camp south of Salisbury and the prison for French prisoners at Winchester bring out with vivid force the fact that our defensive system throughout the eighteenth century and until the end of the nineteenth century was directed against the ancestral enemy france so entirely had the national energies been concentrated in facing towards france that when the menace changed historically with dreamlike rapidity from the channel to the north sea we were so unprepared that no really safe harbor was ready in 1914 for the grand fleet on the eastern coasts either of England or Scotland. This is admirably brought out in Mr. Winston Churchill's book, The World Crisis, 1911-1914. through 1914. Note, see especially page 154, Notes by the First Lord of the Admiralty. The general unpreparedness of the eastern coast of Great Britain on the outbreak of war with Germany is in itself an overwhelming proof that our intentions toward Germany were pacific. September 12th. I breakfast and slept again at the Blue Boar, Oxford, whither the diarist and Will had come via Andover, where they had slept the night of the 11th. About one o'clock dressed myself, and then walked to New College, where I met with Crow, Weber, who has the living, the Atterbury, late Blackstones, Eaton, Coker Sr., and King. I dined, supped, and spent the evening with them at New College. They were the only fellows now in college, and all seniors. I saw the chapel and garden before dinner. In the west window of New College Chapel are three most beautiful emblematical figures of faith, hope, and charity painted on glass. They were done by one Gervais of London, and only put up in the chapel the last week. No painting can exceed them, I think, on glass. The whole of that great west window is to be repainted by him. The design is of Sir Joshua Reynolds, and I could not go to St. Mary Church either morn or afternoon. I called and spoke with Locke this evening, my late silversmith, and he looks very well. He lives where he used to do. September 13th. I breakfast and slept again at the Blue Boar. Before breakfast I took a long walk on the Botley Road, having a violent pain in my stomach, owing, I believe, to eating too many walnuts yesterday at college. On my walk called at a house and had a dram, paid tuppence, after breakfast I took another walk, but longer, over Port Meadow, called at two houses, and had some rum and water at each, being in great pain, paid sixpence. Going over the ferry at Binzi gave tuppence. I dined, supped, and spent the evening at New College with Weber, Crow, Coker Sr., Eaton, and King. Coker and King looked rather cool on me, I thought. It was after eleven this evening before I got to my inn. Dr. Wall, I hear, is married and lives in St. Giles in Oxford. I had no opportunity of seeing him. Weber's fellowship is vacant today or tomorrow. The high street in Oxford is exceeding handsome, being lately paved. Magdalen Bridge also finished. The upper room of New College Library also finished. On September 13th they proceeded by the usual route to Weston, which they reached on September 17th. September 18th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Soon after breakfast my friend Mr. Hall called on me and dined and spent the afternoon with me. Poor Mr. Hall was very uneasy concerning an affair that happened at Walton about three weeks ago, where he was insulted in public company by one Nelthorpe, and, endeavoring to come at him to lick him, had greatly hurt his leg between a door and its lintel. Mr. Hall could not get at him, or else would have licked him handsomely. I wish that he had done it. I gave him for dinner some roast beef and an apple pudding. I sent William this morn to Mr. Custance's at Ringland, and Mr. Duquesne's at Tuddenham, to inquire after them. September 23rd. 
Mr. Howes called on me about dinner time and stayed and dined with me and spent the afternoon. Mr. Howes made so free with my strong beer that he got himself quite drunk, though I pressed him not to take too free. I sent my man Ben home with him. September 25th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Mr. Priest of Repham and son St. John made me a morning visit as they came from Duquesne's. Memo. On Monday morn, last, about eleven o'clock, I pulled off the head of a large flesh fly, and the body had life in it and stood upon its legs, and at different times moved his legs, and so continued till Thursday last, then fell down. September 30th. I let my man Ben have my little mare to go to Norch this morning to try to get a substitute to serve for him in the militia as he is drawn. I paid Mr. Duquesne for serving my church for me in my absence fifteen Sundays at ten shillings sixpence, seven pounds, seventeen shillings sixpence. My man Ben Legate returned home in the evening from Norwich, having got a substitute, and seen him sworn in immediately as well as accepted. He was obliged to give the substitute nine pounds, nine shillings. I gave him, in part of it this evening, one pound, one shilling. October 2nd. As I was out in my garden this morning, in my ermine old hat and wig, beard long and a dirty shirt on, who should walk by at the end of the garden but my squire and Mr. Beecham with him, Mrs. Custon's brother? They walked into my garden and went over it, they liked it exceedingly. They would not walk into my house. October ninth, Had a letter this evening from my sister Pounsett in which she tells me that Sister Clark and Sam and Nancy Woodford are coming to Weston, and were to set off from Ansford on last Wednesday, to stay three or four days in London, and then off for Weston. Two boxes with their clothes were already sent. October twelfth. About eight this evening my sister Clark, Nancy Woodford, and my nephew Samuel Clark arrived at Norwich, where the diarist was meeting them, in the London machine from the west, greatly fatigued by being up all last night. They drank some tea immediately and soon decamped to bed. They slept at the King's Head. October 21st. Mr. and Mrs. Kerr sent over to us this morning to desire that we would dine with them. We sent word back that we could not, having no carriage to go there. He then sent back word that he would send his one-horse chair after the ladies, which we could not refuse complying with. Therefore at about one o'clock Sister Clark and Nancy went in the chair, and myself walked to Mr. Kerr's, and there dined, spent the afternoon, supped, and spent the evening with Mr. and Mrs. Kerr, Mr. Bottom of Mattishall. We had for dinner a leg of pork boiled, a turkey roasted, and a couple of ducks. We had for supper a couple of fowls boiled, a fine pheasant roasted, and some cold things. Dinner and supper served up in china, dishes, and plates. Melons, apples, and pears, walnuts, and small nuts for a dessert. We played at quadrille after tea, at which I won sixpence. My servants Will and Ben went out a coursing this morn by my order, and did not return till after we were gone. They coursed a brace of hares, but killed never a one. We returned as we went, and got home about eleven o'clock. Mr. Kerr would make me accept of a hare also. To Mr. Kerr's servants gave one shilling sixpence. Sister Clark gave the servants three shillings. We spent a very agreeable day indeed at Mr. Kerr's. October 23rd had a letter this evening from Bill Woodford from on board the fortune sloop of war and now at spithead performing quarantine being lately arrived from the barbary coast had been out about two months he informs me that he had suffered many hardships and he seems to be tired of the sea already he now sincerely repents of his late behavior at my house at weston and of his not taking my advice to him he also tells me that he has bought some curious things for me and desires me to accept of them. One of them is a large Moorish sword, also a curious purse with some pieces of money in it. 
between october twenty sixth and thirtieth the diarist sister clark sam clark and nancy woodford enjoyed the now familiar scheme to yarmouth the diarist's guests being highly delighted with the sea having never seen it before they were away spending a night or two at norwich four nights in all we got home to weston about three o'clock and there we dined supped and slept at the old house we all seemed very glad of our getting home october thirty first i read prayers and preached this morning at weston my squire and lady were not at church being from home sister clark and nancy had a little miff to-day november first sister clark and nancy had a high quarrel this morning stephen andrews gave me a greyhound bitch this morning by name fly to five chickens this morning paid two shillings sixpence to chambers of ling for a pair of breeches paid one pound november thirteenth had a letter this evening from mr kingston bursar of new college with a draft in it on hoare the banker for the sum of seventy three pounds ten shillings eleven pence halfpenny being a present from that society for the loss i sustained the first of january owing to the high wind concerning my chancel very handsome indeed was it of them november eighteenth at three o'clock myself and nephew took a ride to the hon charles townsend's note see footnote page two hundred and eleven at honingham where we dined and spent the afternoon by invitation just as we got to mr townsend's mr duquesne overtook us and went with us there and dined etc etc a mr hill and son from wells a rich merchant and owner of the standard inn at wells where mr hall and self slept at wells kept by one smith he with another wells merchant by name springle a very droll sensible man and who has travelled much abroad also dined and spent the afternoon with us mrs townsend was dressed in a scarlet riding dress her head dressed very high and no cap at all on we had for dinner a loin of mutton roasted roast beef a boiled chicken soup pudding etc first course a turkey roasted a roasted hare mushrooms tarts macaroni and a custard pudding etc neither turkey nor hare above half done i never made a worse dinner i think we dined at four drank tea at seven or after at nine we returned home left the other company there madeira and port wine etc to drink after dinner i gave nothing to the servants at mr townsend's mr townsend is going next week for london november thirtieth this being my frolic i had about twenty farmers that dined with me and paid me their several compositions received this day from them two hundred and twenty nine pounds eight shillings sixpence to john pegg for taxes for one half a year paid nine pounds four shillings sixpence i gave them for dinner a fine rump of beef boiled four fowls boiled and bacon a fine neck of pork roasted and quantities of plum puddings sister clark and nancy dined by themselves in the study wine punch and beer as much as they would there was drank three bottles of wine of rum five bottles they all went away about eleven o'clock we did not get to bed till one in the morning december second to a letter from bill woodford paid sevenpence bill woodford is now on board the ariadne frigate of thirty-two guns and now at sheerness the captain whose name is squire is exceeding civil to him bill sent me in a box a present of a sword paid for the carriage of one shilling tuppence december fourth this evening by mr carey came bill's present to me viz a large moorish sword and a curious moor's purse made of morocco leather with some coins in it he also sent me two curious shells and a quill that came from falkland islands it is some gratitude in him i must confess but he expects something in return as he complains in his letter to me of being very low in pocket december eighteenth in the norwich paper this evening i saw my name put down to preach a charity sermon at st stephen's norwich the sixteenth of april next december twenty fifth i breakfast dined supped and slept again at home sister clark 
Nancy and Sam breakfast, etc., here again. Bitter cold indeed all day and froze within doors. James Smith, Mike Clark, Richard Bates, Tom Carey, Tom Carr, Richard Buck, Thomas Dicker, and Tom Cushion all dined at my house today, being Christmas Day, and I gave them for dinner a sirloin of beef roasted and plum puddings, and to each of them to carry home to their wives gave one shilling seven shillings total. I read prayers, preached, and christened two children of Palmer's, by name John and Sarah, this afternoon at Weston, had but a small congregation, neither my squire or lady at church today. End of section 22, 1779. Section 23 of The Diary of a Country Parson by James Woodford, read by John Greenman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1780. Anno Domini, 1780, January 1st. Had a letter this evening from my brother Hyes in which he informed me that he had lately received a letter from Lord Guilford. Note, see footnote, page 245 concerning his son William, who lately waited on Lord Guilford in person as a midshipman, and his lordship desired to know his name and age. We were pleased with it. January 5th. My maid, Nanny Lilliston, left my service this morning, having had proper notice before given her. I paid her a quarter's wages due, now ten shillings, to her also for a quarter's allowance for tea, two shillings sixpence. I gave to her also a free gift of two shillings sixpence. I had no other fault to find with her, but that she did not choose to be under the other maid. In every other respect a very good servant, I believe. Betty Greaves, a girl of about fifteen, came to my house in the room of Nanny Lilliston. She is a neat girl, and I hope will do, though she is small. January 15th received a letter this evening from Sister Pounsett in which she tells me that poor Mrs. Joni Russ of Dimmer is dead. She was a good woman, and I hope now happy. Received also a letter from Bill Woodford, on board the Ariadne sloop, now of the Yarmouth Roads. He tells me that his ship had been in great danger striking on the sands near Yarmouth. It was also on the Norwich newspaper, but got off again. He also tells me that he has not a single farthing in his pocket, and desires me to send him some cash. January 18th. This being our gracious Queen Charlotte's birthday, I fired off my blunderbuss with three charges of powder in it, and a good deal of paper, and gave three cheers. January 28th. I breakfasted, supped, and slept again at home. Sister Clark, Nancy, and Sam breakfast, etc., here again. I went to church this morning a little before twelve, and publicly presented Mr. Custance's child in the church. Sir Edmund Bacon and Lady and Mr. Press Custance assisted as sponsors. Mr. Custance was also at church with the others. After the ceremony Mr. Custance came up to me and presented me with a Norwich banknote of five guineas, wrapped up in some writing paper. He asked me to dine with the company at Ringland at two o'clock therefore I walked by myself there, and dined, and spent the afternoon, and stayed till after seven in the evening, and then walked back home. The company present were Sir Edmund Bacon and Lady, Mr. and Mrs. Custance, and Mr. Press Custance. Coming away gave George the servant two shillings sixpence. We had for dinner a calf's head, boiled fowl and tongue, a saddle of mutton roasted on the side table, and a fine swan roasted with currant jelly sauce for the first course. The second course, a couple of wild fowl called dunfowls, larks, blamange, tarts, etc., etc., and a good dessert of fruit after amongst which was a damson cheese. I never eat a bit of a swan before, and I think it good eating with sweet sauce. The swan was killed three weeks before it was eat, and yet not the less bad taste in it. January 31st. A very comical dull day with us all. Sister Clark very low. In the evening Sam spoke in favor of the Methodists rather too much, I think. 
We did not play cards this evening, as usual. February 4th. This being a day, it was a Friday, for a general fast to be observed through the kingdom, to beg of Almighty God his assistance in our present troubles, being at open rupture with America, France, and Spain, and a blessing on our fleets and armies. I therefore went to Weston Church about eleven o'clock, and read the proper prayers on the occasion, but there was no sermon preached. My squire and lady at church, and there was a very respectable congregation that attended at it. Most of my family went, and Sister Clark and three servants. We did not dine till four o'clock this afternoon. Sent a long letter to my sister Pounset this evening. Sister Clark, Nancy, Sam, and myself all took it in our heads to take a good dose of rhubarb going to bed. February 8th. We were rather comical this evening, as we did not play cards on account of Sam, who disliked it. February 11th. Sister Clark and Nancy had a few words at breakfast. My sister can't bear to hear anyone praised more than herself in anything, but that she does the best of all. February 14th. To sixty children being Valentine's Day, one penny each, five shillings. We were all comical with Sister Clark today against her. Nancy and self played at cribbage. I won of her ninepence. February 17th. The diarist takes tickets for the play for himself and his guests at Norwich. About four, my sister Clark, Nancy, and Sam came in Mr. Duquesne's chaise to the King's Head, and a little after them came Mr. Duquesne and Mr. Hall to the same place, and we all drank coffee and tea together, and then we all went to the play. Sister Clark and Nancy and Sam went in a coach, which I hired. The play was Hamlet, and the entertainment the camp. The play was very well, but the other, like a puppet show, fit only for children. I treated Mr. Duquesne and Mr. Hall with a ticket. Mr. Priest and his brother of Repum came to the theatre to us, and they returned with us to our inn, and there we all supped and spent an agreeable evening together. For the hire of the coach paid and gave three shillings sixpence. We had for supper a couple of roast fowls, a barrel of Colchester oysters, some cold meat and tarts. It was after one o'clock before we got to bed. Mr. Duquesne and Mr. Hall slept at the King's Head. Mr. Priest and brother went home. Both the Mr. Priests offered faintly to pay their part of the reckoning this evening, but I told them there was no occasion for it, which at once they acquiesced in. They did not press it again. Gave Mr. Duquesne's man, Stephen, to go to the play by my servant man, Will, one shilling. March 8th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Sister Clark breakfast, etc., here again, as did Nancy and Sam. We were very queer after dinner today, having but a plain dinner, viz. some hash mutton, a plain suet pudding, and a couple of rabbits roasted. Sam made me rather angry at dinner when I asked Sister Clark if she would have the outside of the pudding or the first cut of it, upon which Sam said, I hope you will not, madam, for you know that I always give the outside to the dogs. March 12th. My maid's brother came to our house this morn to inform his sister that their father was dead. He breakfasted and dined here. My maid, Betty Caxton, Betty was very low all day upon the account. Pray God comfort them all under so great a loss. March 14th. I let my maid, Betty Caxton, have my great horse to go to the funeral of her father. Ben went with her. She returned with Ben in the evening. March 26th. I went to Brand this morning for Mr. Bottom, and there read prayers and administered the holy sacrament for him as he served Mr. Hall's church at Garveston. Brand is about seven miles from my house, and very difficult road to find. I had a very small congregation there, not above twenty people, and not more than seven people at the holy sacrament. When I returned from Brand, I eat a bit of cold mutton, pulled off my boots, and went to Weston Church at half-past two, and read prayers and preached, gave notice of a sacrament on Sunday next, and read four briefs also. 
Mr. Custance and Lady at church, and after church they asked my sister, etc., to dine with them on Tuesday next, and that they would send their carriage after them. They apologized in not asking them before to dine. I had a large congregation at church this afternoon. Sister Clark, Nancy, and Sam went to church. Being Easter Day, I had a loin of veal roasted. Sister Clark was very ill in the colic after dinner. We did not dine till four o'clock this afternoon. March 28th. We all dined and spent the afternoon at Mr. Custance's of Ringland today, and were handsomely entertained. Mr. Custance sent his coach and four after my sister and Nancy with a servant to ride by the coach besides. There were two drivers to the coach. My sister, Nancy, and Sam went in the coach and returned on her. My man, Will, went with me. Just as I was going out of my gate to go there, I met Mr. Duquesne on horseback, who was going to dine with us, and he and I rode together there. We returned to Weston after tea and got home about eight. We had for dinner, for the first course, some fine soup, a roasted pike, a saddle of mutton roasted, some veal collops, etc. The second course, some eggs, a roast fowl, orange pudding, custards, jellies, etc. Madeira, port, and calcavella wines to drink. Oranges and apples by way of dessert. Mr. and Mrs. Custance, Mr. Duquesne, and ourselves all the company. We did not give any veils to servants. Sam talked rather strange to me before breakfast today that I did not behave well to him yesterday. Poor Sam can't take a joke. I forgot what I said to disoblige him. March 30th. Mr. Duquesne sent his chaise after my sister, Nancy, and Sam this morning to go and see Mr. Townsend's house at Huntingham. Mr. Duquesne and self rode on horseback. We got to Huntingham about eleven o'clock, saw the house, and then went round by Sir William Jernigan's at Copsley and saw home. We made quite a pleasant jaunt of it. The weather at first was a little stormy, but at last it turned out fair and fine. Mr. Townsend's house most superbly furnished, stately rooms and very grand furniture. Mr. Duquesne returned with us to dinner and stayed with us till about nine in the evening. I gave him for dinner a bit of boiled beef and a turkey roasted. At quadrille this evening lost sixpence. April 2nd. Sam lost his purse this afternoon, in which was a guinea and some silver, supposed to be lost within doors, but could nowhere be found today. April 3rd. No tidings of Sam's purse or money at all today, but my servants are suspected, as Sam says he is certain that he dropped it in my kitchen. I cannot think they are guilty. April 4th. A guinea and one of the rings of Sam's purse were found by my little maid Betty this morning among the ashes in the kitchen grate. Sam, in taking out his handkerchief out of his coat pocket, where he always kept his purse, must take the purse out with it, and standing by the fire might fall into the fire. Both guinea and ring quite black. My servants were very glad the above was found, as they were very uneasy on being suspected. April 6th. I sent Justice Buxton this morning a basket of my fine beefens, a very fine kind of apples. April 9th. I read prayers and preached this afternoon at Weston. Mr. Press Custance Lady at Weston, she sent before church to me for leave to sit in my seat, which I granted. My sister did not go to church, as I desired her not, on account of the above lady sitting in my seat today. Mr. and Mrs. Kerr at Weston Church, and in my seat in the chancel. April 15th. Sister Clark made me rather angry this morning about the fifty pound that I have of hers. She wants to have it now, but I told her that she could not have it till the estate that I bought with the money was sold again, that of Speed's. I told her that I would let her have five guineas to carry her home, but no more. April 16th. The diarist is at Norwich to preach a charity sermon. At three o'clock this afternoon I walked with Mr. Francis, Sr. to St. Stephen's Church, and there heard the Reverend Mr. Carrington read prayers, and as soon as prayers were over 
I walked out of my seat into the vestry and stayed there till the psalm was near sung, and then I walked out and went up into the pulpit, a man walking before me with a wand, and preached a charity sermon, towards the relief of the charity schools in the city of Norwich. Many of the children attended at the church. The church was very fully crowded by rich and poor. The mayor was present, being treasurer of the charity. I had some conversation with the mayor in the vestry room, and inquired for his brother, the Bishop of Rochester, Dr. Thurlow, late of Magdalen College in Oxford, and who has dined with me at New College. I gave towards the charity ten shillings sixpence. There was collected at church for the charity seven pounds thirteen shillings apenny. April 17th. About five o'clock my sister and Sam went off in Lenwichez for Norwich to take coach for London this night. I sent my man Will with them to Norwich. Will returned about ten at night and informed us that they got safe to Norwich, but could not go from thence till tomorrow night, the coach being full. I lent my sister towards bearing her expenses five pounds five shillings. I gave Sam my little book of maps, Atlas Minimus. We were all very low at parting with each other, poor Nancy very low indeed. I gave to Nancy this evening five shillings. My head maid slept with Nancy, and is so to do. April 18th. Mr. Duquesne sent his chairs here today, about one o'clock, to carry us to the rotation, and about half-past one we both got into it and went to his house, and there we dined, spent the afternoon, and part of the evening with him, Mr. and Mrs. Howes, Mr. and Mrs. Dawson, little Miss Roop, a Captain Loddington, and Mr. Bottom. We were very merry till just at last, when Mr. Howes behaved strangely, that is, Mrs. Howes had invited all the company to dinner on Thursday next, and all settled, but just as Mr. Howes was going away he desired to be excused from having company at his house to dinner on the above day, but should be glad to see them at tea. It made all the company stare again. Nancy and myself got home about ten in Mr. Duquesne's chaise, but was rather afraid as the driver was merry, but he drove us very well and very safe. Captain Loddington is a cheerful little man, and not above twenty years of age, if so much. He was on board the Monmouth when last engaged by the French. He has seen a good deal of service aboard in the East Indies, has been in the service about four years, is first lieutenant in the sixty-one company of marines. April 24th. Nancy began learning Latin of me this day. April 26th busy in painting some boarding in my wall-garden which was put up to prevent people in the kitchen seeing those who had occasion to go to jericho april twenty seventh nancy desired me to let her have aristotle's philosophy to read this afternoon miss millard she says has got it in the country and had it off a married woman april thirtieth i read prayers and preached this morning at weston after services i ordered the clerk to give notice that the bounds of the parish would be gone over on wednesday next to meet at the heart by ten o'clock may thirtieth i breakfast dined supped and slept again at home about one half past nine o'clock this morning my squire called on me and i took my mare and went with him to the heart note the heart survives as an inn at weston looking precisely the same i imagine as it has looked for some centuries it is a charming little old inn with the coziest of kitchens to the heart just by the church where most of the parish were assembled to go to the bounds of the parish and at ten we all set off for the same about thirty in number went towards ringland first then to the brakes near mr townsend's clumps from thence to atterton's on france green where the people had some liquor and which I paid, being usual for the rector, four shillings sixpence. Mr. Press Custance was with us also. From France Green we went away to Mr. Dade's, from thence towards Risings, from thence down to Mr. Gallon's, then to the old hall of my squires, thence to the old bridge at Lenwade, 
then close to the river till we came near morton then by mr legers's clumps then by baker's and so back till we came to the place where we first set off mr custance senior then called the six following old men that is richard bates thomas carey thomas dicker richard buck thomas cushion and thomas carr and gave each of them half a guinea to george wharton who carried a hook and marked the trees my squire gave also five shillings to robin hubbard also who carried a spade he gave five shillings and sent all the rest of the people to the heart to eat and drink as much as they would at his expense the squire behaved most generously on the occasion he asked me to go home and dine with him but i begged to be excused being tired as i walked most of the way our bounds are supposed to be about twelve miles round we were going off them full five hours we set off at ten in the morning and got back a little after three in the afternoon nancy was got to dinner when i returned ben will and jack all went the bounds ben's father william leggett in crossing the river on horseback was thrown off and was overhead and ears in the river my squire's man john was likely to have had a very bad accident in leading the squire's horse over a boggy place both horses were stuck fast up to their bellies and by plunging threw him off in the mire and was very near being hurt by the horses plunging to get out but by great and providential means escaped free from any mischief the horses also were not injured at all the man had his new suit of livery on and new hat which were made very dirty where there were no trees to mark holes were made and stones cast in may ninth to a man whose name was pedrayo an italian and who is the manager of the fireworks at bunn's gardens at norwich and who makes thermometers and barometers and carries them about the country called at my house this morning with some of them and i bought one of each for which i paid him one pound sixteen shillings may thirteenth had a letter this evening from my sister Pounsett, enclosed in a frank of ben allen's in which she informed me that my aunt jane of bath was dead and had left all that she had to her maid betty a great disappointment to my uncle tom and family however pray god she may be forever happy may seventeenth i did not go to bed till after twelve at night as i expected richard andrews the honest smuggler with some gin may twenty first nancy had a new pair of stays brought home this morning by one mottram a staymaker at norwich she paid him for the same one pound eleven shillings sixpence for his journey from norwich to measure her she paid two shillings sixpence i read prayers preached and christened a child by name george this afternoon at weston church my squire and lady mr and mrs carr mr press custa's mistress and some other genteel strangers at church this afternoon mr hardy and wife dined with our folks in kitchen may twenty seventh to richard andrews smuggler for two tubs of gin paid two pounds ten shillings had another letter from bill woodford on board the ariadne he has been in an engagement but not hurt mr carey carrier forgot my wigs from norwich this evening mr duquesne's name mentioned on chase's norwich paper to-day to succeed to a prebendary of ely in the room of dr harvey lately deceased june third had a very long letter this evening from my sister clark and a very civil one i wish she had sent it before especially as i have sent a letter to my sister pouncet wherein i upbraided mrs clark for not writing june fifth mr mann's boy who was taking care of some horses in a field where there was a large clay pit full of water by accident fell in and was drowned and found about noontime quite dead he was a child of one spinks by the church a sad misfortune indeed but hope the poor lad is much happier than if he had stayed longer here mr mann very uneasy june ninth 
about two o'clock who should make his appearance at my house but nancy's brother william who is a midshipman aboard the ariadne of twenty guns he came from yarmouth on horseback this morning he wore his uniform and he dined supped and slept at my house nancy was very happy to see him indeed june tenth great riots have been in london this week these were the gordon riots an outburst of uncontrolled mob violence fomented by the maniacal lord george gordon son of the duke of gordon against the roman catholics they were the sequel to the measure note one a measure supported in the house of lords by that singularly magnanimous statesman lord shelburne see lord fitzmaurice's shelburne volume two pages forty one and forty two nineteen twelve edition the measure recently promoted by sir george saville which aimed at mitigating some of the acerbities of the existing anti-catholic statutes the sequel in the sense that the fanatical spirit of religious persecution was aroused thereby the house of lord mansfield the lord chief justice who was supposed to be sympathetic to the catholics was burned with its priceless library and he himself narrowly escaped destruction wednesday night will be remembered by all the present inhabitants of london and westminster to their latest hour for the horrors and calamities with which it abounded the king's bench marshal sea and fleet prisons the dwelling-house shop and distillery of a roman catholic in holborn the house of another in great queen street and of a third in the poultry all these and more furnished a sight from my observatory particularly that of the distillery which surpassed the appearance of mount vesuvius in all its fury so wrote dr charles burney to the rev t twining on sunday june eleventh note twining correspondence pages eighty to eighty four john murray eighteen eighty two readers of the memoirs of william hickey will remember his description volume two pages two sixty five to two sixty six of the scene of desolation in london following the riots the outbreak was of course purely a fanatical mob affair and decent protestant opinion was greatly shocked of such was the rev t twining who replying in july seventeen eighty to dr burney brilliantly observes as to toleration we are children yet the very word proves it religious liberty can never be upon its right footing while that word exists tolerate it is a word of insult suppose a man should say to you when you were commending pacioretti a famous musician sir your opinion is very different from mine but however i shall put up with it june eleventh bill breakfast dined and drank tea this afternoon and about five o'clock this evening he went for yarmouth to go on board the ariadne nancy very low at parting i made bill a present this afternoon of five pounds five shillings june thirteenth i dined and spent the afternoon at mr de Keen's, being his rotation with him mr howes and mr bottom we had for dinner a leg of mutton boiled and capers three nice spring chickens roasted and a pig's face and pudding i returned home about nine o'clock and who should i see but nancy's brother returned from yarmouth his ship being sailed but will return ere long june sixteenth bill painted our coat of arms to-day on the front of the temple just erected in my garden june seventeenth bill breakfast and spent the morning at weston and about one o'clock set off for yarmouth he had my little mare to ride some of the way and my servant will went with him on the great horse will did not return till near eleven at night i began to be very uneasy on his not returning but he told me that there was no coach set out for yarmouth all this day for norwich and therefore he went with bill as far as ackle eleven miles beyond norwich a confirmation of the news of yesterday on the papers and the disturbances in london quite over charlestown in carolina taken and eight thousand of the rebels killed and taken note one this success and subsequent victories by lord cornwallis roused hopes which were shattered on october nineteenth seventeen eighty one 
by the surrender of Yorktown, into which Cornwallis had been hemmed by Washington and the French. June 18th. I read prayers and preached this afternoon at Weston, my squire and lady at church and a brother of hers, press Custance's woman at church and in my seat also. June 19th. My squire called on me this morning and talked to me a good deal about his brother's mistress sitting in my seat yesterday and whether she had leave and also that she strutted by them in a very impudent manner coming out of church and stared at mrs custance june twentieth at half past twelve i took a ride to norwich and will with me got to norwich about two got off my mare just within the gates and called at a public house and had some porter paid tuppence gave will to go to quantrella gardens this evening one shilling i walked through st giles street and it being the guild day for swearing in the new mayor one day and who lives in st giles the street was full of people and a number of flags hanging out of the windows the market-place also was full of people and quite down to st andrew's hall where they all dined i saw the procession from st andrew's hall up to the old guildhall in coaches and all but full dressed and a very great appearance they made a band of music before and the musicians dressed in gowns bells ringing etc etc after that i walked about the city by myself till near five in the afternoon and in my walk saw quantrella gardens at five drank tea at the king's head after that went to mr buckles there stayed and talked with him and mr sterling till near six o'clock from thence walked to quantrella gardens by myself heard a sad concert and saw the fireworks which were very good and worth seeing gave on going one shilling for which you have sixpence worth of anything at the bar i supped and spent the evening there and stayed till twelve o'clock for my supper and liquor paid one shilling sixpence a very heavy storm fell about nine o'clock a prodigious number of common girls there and dressed the fireworks began about eleven o'clock and lasted about an hour in it a representation of the engagement between the english and the french fleet under sir george rodney Note, these fireworks seem to have been in celebration of the engagements between admiral rodney seventeen nineteen to ninety two and the french fleet off the west indies in april and may seventeen eighty the actions were in fact quite ineffective the french fleet on each occasion escaping more successful was rodney's attack on and seizure of the wealthy dutch island of st eustatius early in seventeen eighty one but rodney's fame is of course based on the wonderful victory over de grasse on april twelfth seventeen eighty two off the west indies a victory which enabled the government to enter on peace negotiations after an otherwise disastrous war on much more favorable terms c d n b under rodney about twelve i came away called at a house on the road spent one shilling sixpence i was very much tired by walking so much to-day was upon the foot almost from two to twelve at night i returned to the king's head about one o'clock had some rum and water and went to bed my squire and lady at the mayor's feast and at the assembly in the evening and they went home after near four hundred people at dinner with the mayor and some of the first fashion three hundred dishes for dinner dainties of all sorts there besides three bucks june twenty third after breakfast this morning i sent my maid betty to mr press custance's mistress miss sharman to desire her not to make use of my seat in the chancel any more as some reflections had been thrown on me for giving her leave i likewise sent will to mr cars on the same account as i was willing to make it general miss sharman sent word back by betty that she was much obliged to me for the use she had already made of it and did not take it at all amiss in me she knew from whence it came and that she would get a new seat made mr carr sent me word that he was not the least angry with me and he expected it about two took a ride to ringland and dined and spent the afternoon with my squire 
his wife, Lady Bacon, and Mr. Prideaux, grandson of the famous and learned Dr. Prideaux, who wrote The Connections. Note. Humphrey Prideaux, D.D., 1648 to 1724, Dean of Norwich from 1702, was a considerable Oriental scholar. His chief works were his Life of Mahomet, 1697, and his Connection, 1716 to 1718, which dealt with the interval between the Old and New Testaments, a book frequently reprinted and translated into French and German. His letters were edited from the Camden Society by Sir E. Maund Thompson in 1875. See D.N.B. Mrs. Constance asked for Nancy, but Mr. Constance said nothing at all about her, which I think not right. June 24th. Mr. Carr called on me this morning and talked to me about my sending to him yesterday, but not the least angry with me. He told me he thought it would make a breach between the two Custances. My squire sent his brother a note, before I sent. To old Joe Adcock's wife, her husband being ill, one shilling. June 25th, I read prayers and preached this morning at Weston, my squire and lady at church, but both went out of church much sooner than they used to do. Nobody in my seat. July 13th. Mr. Duquesne's man, Robert, brought me some cherries this afternoon, I suppose by his master's orders. Mr. Duquesne set off yesterday morn with Mr. Townsend for Scotland, alias North Britain. Mrs. Townsend also with them. Cousin James Lewis, same to my house this evening on foot, and only a dog with him by name Juno. He supped and slept at my house. He came here about eight o'clock. July 15th had a letter this evening from my sister Pounsett, in which she mentions that our brother, John, had a fall lately from his horse at Evercreech, and put out his shoulder-bone, being a little merry. I hope it will be of service to him, as it is a miracle almost that he never hurt himself before. July 21st, I heard nothing from Justice Brainthwaite, alias Gobble, today about fishing yesterday. The diarist had had leave to fish below Attlebridge from one Michael Andrews, and the justice's estates only came up to the river on one side. From his nickname, Gobble, he must have been an unpleasant fellow. He had seen the diarist fishing, and said he would send to him. July 24th. The Press Gang. Note see page nine from norwich came to weston last night and carried off a man from odenham green about nine o'clock august third mr thomas of derham brother of the bishop of rochester a mr paley who is to be ordained deacon on sunday next and is to be the curate to mr thomas michaelmas next at derham and mr hall dined and spent the afternoon with us and stayed with us till after seven in the evening I gave them for dinner some fish, a piece of boiled beef, beans and bacon, a couple of ducks roasted, and some apple tarts. We spent the afternoon in the temple. August 11th. My great horse, much worse this morning, he had been taken ill the day before, and dosed with gin and beer, was walked up to Reeves again, and Ben with him. The doctor gave Ben a draft for him to take, but the poor horse was so ill on his return that we could not give it him, and about ten o'clock this morning died. I endeavored to bleed him a little before, and sent Will to Gould of Adelbridge to come and see him, but he was dead long before he came. Gould said that he died of a fever in the bowels, and that he should have been bled, and had a clyster and some cooling physic also. I'm very sorry for him, as he was so good-natured a beast." don't intend to employ Reeves any more as a farrier. I could not have thought he would have died so soon. The death of my poor good-natured horse, by name Jack, made me very uneasy all the day long. Ben and Will skinned him. We kept one half of him, and we gave the other half to Mr. Press Custance. Whatever the skin fetches is to be divided between Will and Ben and Jack. August 12th fretting and vexing about my horse made me much out of order to-day quite low august twenty first cousin lewis breakfast here 
and about nine o'clock took his leave of us and sent off on foot for nottinghamshire i gave him going away one pound eleven shillings sixpence i gave him besides a coat and waistcoat three pair of breeches a pair of stockings and a pair of new shoes since he has been with us august twenty sixth bad news on the papers sixty sail of east and west india ships taken by the french and spanish fleets september eighth mr howes sent his chaise after my niece to go and dine at hockering i rode my mare there we dined and spent the afternoon at mr howes with him his wife mrs davy and daughter betsy charles and turner roop mr payne and wife with a long chin mr don and his new married lady and Mr. and Mrs. Hewitt of Mattenshall, at whose house Mr. and Mrs. Don are at. Mrs. Don is a, an agreeable lady, but rather deaf. We had for dinner a leg of mutton boiled and capers, a couple of fowls boiled and a tongue, a couple of ducks roasted, some blamage and tarts. At quadrille this afternoon one sixpence. Turner Roop is in the militia and appeared in regimentals. We returned to Weston about nine o'clock. Charles Roop accompanied Nancy back in the chaise. I was on my mare and caught in a little storm on the road, gave Ty, the driver of the chaise, two shillings, gave to a boy that went behind the chaise sixpence, great bustle at Norwich on account of the dissolution of Parliament, great opposition expected. The election is to be for the city on Monday next. September 11th this day the election began for the city of norwich n b candidates for norwich mr bacon see page two thirty three footnote sir harbert harbert mr windham and mr thurlow september twelfth sir harbert harbert and mr bacon rechosen for norwich september nineteenth my man will coleman had a citation from the ecclesiastical court to appear there the third of october in a cause respecting defamation note see remarks on pages sixty nine and seventy defamation of one anne lillystone who lived with me last year and is now with child by a servant man of john bowles by name robert woodcock will was in a peck of troubles about it though nothing nancy and myself dined and spent the afternoon at mr custance's of ringland with him and his lady we spent a very agreeable day there Mrs. Custance came after Nancy in a coach and four, in which also I went, and we returned in the same about seven. To the coachman and postillion and an outrider gave three shillings. September 22nd, my squire called on me this morning to desire me to come over in the afternoon and privately name his newborn son. I married one John Want and Rose Branton this morning by license at Weston Church, a compelled marriage, and B. am owed by Mr. Mann, the church warden, for marrying them, as I could not change a guinea, ten shillings sixpence. I took a ride in the afternoon to Mr. Custance's of Ringland and privately named his child by name Edward. I stayed and drank a dish of coffee with the squire and one with Mr. Martineau of Norwich, a doctor and man midwife. Note doubtless an ancestor, possibly grandfather, certainly a kinsman of the famous nineteenth-century Martineau, Harriet and her brother James. The Martineaus were of Huguenot origin. Gaston Martineau of Dieppe, settling as a surgeon in Norwich after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, in the biography of George Martineau by James Drummond and C. B. Upton, 1902, it is stated, pages two and three, the profession of this founder of the English branch of the Martineaus became to some extent hereditary. In the records of the French church at Norwich, we twice meet with the name of David Martineau entered as that of an eminent surgeon. Philip Meadows Martineau, the uncle of James, was also distinguished, and within the family in Magdalen Street the eldest son devoted himself to the ancestral calling received a printed letter from the bishop to send him an account of the roman catholics in my parish but i don't know of one in it september twenty third had another letter from my sister pounceet this evening to inform me that my niece sophie clark and my nephew robert white 
were set off together to be married. James and Richard Clark, Frank Woodford, and his wife were all confounded angry about it, as they think Robert too much of the clown. Their pride is hurt much. For my part, I think it a good match on both sides, and if they marry, I wish them happy. They are both good-natured. September 28th. The diarist and Will ride to Norwich. Went to Mr. Morphew's office to talk with him about my servant Will being cited into court, but he was not at home. September 29th. After breakfast walked again to Mr. Morphew's, but he was not come home. I talked with his clerks. From thence went to Mr. Utton's of the cathedral and employed him as a proctor for my servant. Gave him a retaining fee of five shillings. We hear no more of the case, and may presume that Will was exculpated from the charge of defaming Anne Lillystone. October 13th. Mr. Carey's daughter, the widow Pratt, is, we hear, with child by her servant that lived with her last year, but she pretends to say that she was ravished one night coming from her father's by a man whom she does not know. October 15th. Will came home drunk this evening after supper from Barnard Dunnell's at Morton, and he and my head maid had words and got to fighting. Will behaved very saucy and impudent, and very bold in his talk to me. Shall give it to him tomorrow for the same. October 16th. I gave Will a lecture this morning concerning last night's work. October 24th. My squire, Mr. Constance, called on me this morning and spent the best part of an hour with me. He talked with me about his new tenants, Gallant and Howlett, concerning tithe, but spoke very open and ingenuous about it, and left it entirely to me respecting the same. Mrs. Davy came to us this morning and dined and spent the afternoon with us. Mrs. Davy slipped of the horse as she was getting up to go home. She did not hurt herself. I laughed much. November 12th I read prayers and preached this morning at Weston. Neither my squire nor lady at church this morning. As I was returning from church this morning, Mr. Press Custance overtook me and acquainted me that Mr. Custance had lost his last, i.e. latest, child this morning. It had been ill some time. I walked with Mr. Press Custance back to the church and fixed on a place in the church where the child is to be buried. We heard this morning by Mr. Press Custance that many people were robbed yesterday between Norwich and Mattishall by two highwaymen. They are both known and were very near being taken. One of them is a nephew of one Parfaroy, a gardener at Ringland, and his name is Husson. My man Ben knows him very well. These two fellows slept at Ben's father's on Friday night, and were in the parish of Weston most of the day yesterday. Nancy was much alarmed on hearing the above. It was lucky that I did not go to Norwich last week. November 13th. About eleven o'clock this morning took a ride to Norwich, and my servant William Coleman went with me. I carried with me upwards of a hundred and fifty pound in bills and cash, and got to Norwich very safe with the same went to Mr. Kerriston's bank, and there received a bank note of a hundred and fifty pounds, which I immediately enclosed in a letter and sent it by the post to Dr. Bathurst of Christ Church, and which I hope will get safe to him there. This was the tithe the diarist had collected for his friend Dr. Bathurst, the non-resident parson of the neighboring parish of Witchingham. Kerriston the banker asked me to dine with him, but could not. At four o'clock this afternoon I set off for Weston, and got home safe and well, thank God, about six in the evening. Dr. Bathurst's name is mentioned frequently in the diary, and an outline of his life may help the reader. He was Henry Bathurst, 1744 to 1837, nephew of the first Earl Bathurst, and from 1805 Bishop of Norwich. He was the diarist's contemporary and friend both at Winchester and at New College. As a bishop he was notable as being in politics a liberal, considered indeed at the time uh, the only uh, liberal uh, bishop in the House of Lords, and as a warm supporter of Catholic emancipation. His eldest son Henry was also in the church, and was appointed, presumably by his father, Archdeacon of Norwich in 1814. The diarist 
did not live to see his old friend made bishop of norwich otherwise he himself might have been promoted for his faithful services in collecting tithes for the non-resident rector of Witchingham. between seventeen seventy five and eighteen o five dr bathurst was canon of christ church oxford the author of the notice in the dictionary of national biography says that dr bathurst's love of literature was great and his literary instinct just there is a fine statue of him in norwich cathedral november fifteenth went to church this morning at eleven o'clock and there buried mr constance's son edward aged seven weeks and three days the corpse was brought in a coach and four attended by two servant maids in very deep mourning and long black hoods mr press Custance was the chief mourner none of their relations attended besides neither mr nor mrs Custance there the coffin was led with a breastplate on it and on that was engraved the age and name of the child the breastplate was plain and made thus circular the child was buried in the church in the north aisle the coach came up close to the church door the drivers and other servants had hatbands and gloves i had also a fine black silk hatband tied with white love ribband and a pair of white gloves after the funeral mr press Custance gave me a bit of white paper sealed up with mr Custance's arms on it and in which there were five pounds five shillings only a clean white napkin covered the lead coffin very rough with much snow this morning and very cold november eighteenth had a letter this evening from my sister pounsett who informed us that the late mr guppy had left mr pounsett whole and sole executor that mrs pounsett of coal had thirty pounds per annum for her life that mr guppy's maid sybil had ten pounds in cash and a little house and garden left her by mr guppy also received also a letter from bill woodford from sheerness who tells us that he is going to leave the ariadne the captain whose name is squire and him not agreeing and that he intends to try again for the lieutenancy of marines i am afraid he will not turn out well in the end as he is so unsteady i doubt not but that he has given captain squire just cause to be angry with him robert white and sophia clark who eloped my sister tells us are married were married in devonshire november twenty first the two highwaymen that lately infested these roads were taken at swaffham last night or this morning november twenty fifth i took my men will ben jack out a coursing this morning after breakfast and coursed till three in the afternoon caught a brace of hares and a rabbit december second had edmunds on complete body of heraldry two large folio volumes in boards brought home this evening by mr carey and which i bespoke some time ago being desired by bathurst to accept of some books a great while ago and therefore fixed on the above note this book is now in the possession of dr r e h woodford see prefatory note and contains a charming latin inscription referring to their w's and b's early friendship from winchester days see also page two ninety five on december fifth the diarist has his annual tithe frolic with the usual excellent hospitality for the farmers who attended it mr press Custance neither came or sent to me which i think very ungenteel after my sending so civil a note december seventh paid mr thomas palmer for malt for a year twenty two pounds to a travelling peddler for moore's almanac paid eightpence to ditto for the lady's pocket-book one shilling mr palmer brought me a very large hare but very old one i believe it be however it was kind of him december ninth received a letter from edmund lewis son of cousin james lewis to let us know that his father the above cousin james lewis was dead that he died the twenty fourth of september last owing he said to laying in a pair of damp sheets on his return from my house homeward i had a letter from cousin james lewis soon after he got home which mentions nothing of his catching the least cold 
and it was wrote in good spirits by him. Edmund also mentions in his letter that his father should say that he had left some shirts behind him here, but poor man he never brought any but what he had on his back when he came here. I am very sorry for him, hope that God will pardon his past errors, and that he is now happy. It is strange that his son should not acquaint us of his death long before. His sending now was only to beg charity of me, and hope I would be kind to the family. December 15th. Nancy and myself, being rather out of spirits and ill last night, took a dose of rhubarb each last night, and this morning we were both brave. Mr. Hall dined and spent the afternoon with us. He also dined here the day that I went to Norwich with Nancy. Nancy was not well pleased with him, and about leaving a dog here behind him, which, however, he did not, as Nancy was against it. I gave him for dinner some fish and a shoulder of mutton roasted. He left us about four o'clock. Mrs. Davy called here this afternoon, in Mr. Howe's chaise, with her daughter Betsy, who is just returned from school, and is to spend a few days with Nancy. Therefore Mrs. Davy left her with us. Betsy slept with my niece, Nancy Woodford. December 16th. Nancy had a letter from her brother Will this evening, wherein he mentions that all matters between him and his captain are made up, dated from Sheerness. Little Betsy Davy cried a good deal this evening after supper, but about what I know not. She is of a very meek spirit, poor little maid. December 20th. Mrs. Davy came on foot to our house this morning, just after we had breakfast, and she stayed and dined and spent the afternoon and part of the evening with us till seven o'clock, and then went home on horseback behind Mr. Howe's servant, who came after her. It was very dark when Mrs. Davy went away. Little Betsy Davy complaining of a headache this morning. I gave her a little rhubarb this evening, which she took exceeding well, and I hope will do her good. Betsy Davy is a very good, sensible child, talks like a woman, though but ten years of age. December 21st, to poor people of this parish being St. Thomas's Day, gave each of them sixpence against Christmas, gave in the whole today forty-four in number, one pound, two shillings. My squire gave them a shilling apiece. December 25th. I read prayers and administered the Holy Sacrament this morning at Weston, being Christmas Day. My squire and lady both at church and at the sacrament. This being Christmas Day, the following old poor men dined at my house, and I gave each of them a shilling to carry home to their wives. Richard Bates, Richard Buck, Thomas Dicker, Thomas Carey, Thomas Cushion, Thomas Carr, and my clerk, James Smith. In all, gave them seven shillings. I had a prodigious fine sirloin of beef roasted with quantities of plum puddings. We also began on mince pies today at dinner. December 30th. Nancy had her new cotton gown brought home this evening from Norwich by Mr. Carey, and I think very handsome, trimmed with green ribbon, a cotton of my choice. December 31st. This being the last day of the year, we sat up till after twelve o'clock, then drank a happy new year to all our friends, and went to bed. We were very merry indeed after supper till twelve. Nancy and Betsy Davy locked me into the great parlor, and both fell on me and pulled my wig almost to pieces. I paid them for it, however. End of section 23, 1780《24 of the Diary of a Country Parson by James Woodford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. 1781, Part 1. January 9th. Mr. Hall breakfasted and spent the morning with us, and about noon he eat a bit of cold beef and then went off for Durham. This being the assembly night at Durham, and the first this winter there, Mr. Hall is a subscriber to the Durham Assembly. Durham Assembly is monthly and only four assemblies. January 11th. 
this day heard the news that jersey was taken by the french and retaken by the islanders afterwards between four and six thousand french landed there but were all destroyed or taken prisoner by us it is too good news to be true i am afraid the whole of it is country news very bad hearing of nothing but highwaymen and breaking houses open at norwich trade at norwich never worse poor no employment January 13th. Mrs. Dade was robbed this evening coming from Norwich near the Three Mile Stone, and had two guineas taken from her by a single footpad. January 14th. Gave Betsy Davy this evening a fine bright shilling. Betsy was sent for on horseback this afternoon, but I would not let her go as she is not well. January 16th. Betsy Davy, very bad indeed today, was obliged to be brought downstairs about noon but could not sit up long being in such violent pain in her right knee and left foot something like the gout the pain was so great towards the evening that she cried incessantly betty the maid sat up with her all night as she was so ill it alarmed me much and the more so as we had sent in the morning to her mamma to let her know that she was better which she was till she was had up nancy and myself sat up in the study all the night long as she was so ill and we thought her very dangerously so we amused ourselves most of the night by playing cribbage we played twelve rubbers at sixpence per rubber at which i won one shilling but had lost to her before one shilling sixpence so that it reduced my loss to sixpence next day betsy's mamma and dr thorne are sent for physic administered etc and in a few days Betsy is better. January 21st. I read prayers and preached this morning at Weston, neither my squire or lady at church, but a small congregation. Mrs. Davy, Nancy, and Betsy gave me a good trimming this evening. January 24th. I was sadly used this evening by Mrs. Davy, Nancy, and Betsy, had my money picked out of my pocket of eleven shillings sixpence. January 26th. The eleven shilling sixpence that was taken out of my pocket the other night, Mrs. Davy, is to lay out on an apron for Nancy, by my consent. We had for dinner today some beef steaks and mutton steaks, a couple of fowls roasted, and mince pies. January 27th. Nancy had a letter from her father and another from her brother Will. Her father informs that his son Sam was at Mr. Hoare's and is taken great notice of by Mr. Hoare for his ingenuity in painting, etc. Note, see page 208 for a notice of Samuel Woodford, R.A. Mrs. Davy sent me some brawn and oysters by Mr. Carey, and likewise a silk bonnet for my maid, Betty. January 30th. Was very ill this morning, being much disturbed, and had very little rest during last night. Mr. and Mrs. Howes, Mrs. Davy, and Mr. Hall dined and spent the afternoon with us. Mrs. Davy stayed and supped and slept here. I gave them for dinner a knuckle of veal and a tongue, a prodigious fine cock turkey roasted, and which weighed, when alive, twenty pound, and a currant pudding. February 3rd had but an indifferent night of sleep. Mrs. Davy and Nancy made me up an apple pie bed last night. February 12th. We did not go to bed till after twelve this night, the wind being still very high. We were as merry as we could be. I took of Mrs. Davy's garter to-night and kept it. I gave her my pair of garters, and I am to have her other to-morrow. Next day Mrs. Davy, who had been staying at the rectory on and off since January 30th, went to Parson Howes of Hockering, taking Betsy with her who had been at the hospitable diarist since December 15th. February 17th. Mr. Howes made us a morning visit, and brought Nancy a pair of tongs to pinch her hair with from Mrs. Davy as a present to her. February 18th. I read prayers and preached, read a proclamation for a fast on Wednesday next, and churched Forster's wife this morning at Weston Church. My squire at church, but not his lady received for churching Forster's wife one shilling. February 19th. I christened two children, twins, this morning, privately at my house, by names Anne and Susanna. 
they are two spurious children of one Anne Lillestone, late a servant-maid of mine. February 21st. This being the day for a general fast to be observed during our present troubles, I went to church this morning and read prayers, but did not preach. I had a large congregation that attended. February 22nd. I was very stingy this morning, alias in a bad humor, and made Nancy uneasy by my talking. About ten this morning took a ride to Mr. Townshend's clumps, there met to Keene, by appointment, and went a-coursing. We coursed till two o'clock, had a number of courses, saw at least twelve brace of hares, and killed only one hare. My bitch Duchess went with me, and she had not begun coursing before she was caught in a rabbit gin by one of her forefeet. She did not perform at all well after, being very shy, and her foot painful. I went home with Duquesne, and dined and spent the afternoon with him and Mr. Hall. We had for dinner some brawn, boiled pork and peas, and a hare roasted, but spoiled by being overdone. March 3rd. Will went on my little mare to Duquesne's this morning with my greyhound duchess a-coursing. I could not go. I sent by Will to Mr. Townshend's gamekeeper Jack one shilling. They killed two brace. Mr. Duquesne sent me back an hare. Will returned time enough to wait at dinner. March 14th. In the afternoon I took a ride to Norwich. Will went with me, within a mile of Norwich, and then I got off and sent my mare back by Will to Weston. I supped and slept at the King's Head, put a letter to Dr. Bathurst into the post this evening, and in it two bills of ten pounds each. Great and good news brought from London this evening an account of the English having taken St. Eustatia and St. Martin's, two of the Caribbee islands in the West Indies, from the Dutch, with 270 sail of ships. See footnote, page 287. March 15th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at King's Head. Mr. Hall came to Norwich about twelve o'clock to the King's Head, and we dined, etc., together there. We had some fresh salmon for dinner to-day. Great rejoicings in the city all day, St. Peter's bells ringing all day. The city cannon, five in number, were fired three times. The light horse also were drawn up in the market-place about twelve o'clock, and fired three volleys. Illuminations at night over the city with large bonfires. After dinner Mr. Hall sent his comps to a Captain Coleman of the Marines, and that he would come and drink a glass of wine with us, which he did, and likewise went to the play with us, and after supped, and spent the evening with us till two in the morn. We went to the theatre after the five act of the play, which was The Plain Dealer. The entertainment, which was Harlequin Touchstone, was highly diverting. The play, etc., was over about ten o'clock. We did not sup till after eleven at night. At the theatre paid half-price, one shilling sixpence, Two other trifling expenses this evening paid three shillings sixpence. The marketplace was full of people this evening and very noisy, fireworks, etc., playing off. March 16th. I breakfast and spent the morning at Norwich. Mr. Hall and Captain Coleman breakfast with me. After breakfast I took a walk to Priest's and tasted some wine and ordered a Q.R. of a pipe with three gallons of rum and three gallons of the best Holland Geneva. To two ivory shuttles for a Nancy of Baker paid one shilling. To seven pieces of wood a puzzle thing paid sixpence. About one o'clock Mr. Hall and myself left Norwich, and he went home to Weston with me and dined and spent the afternoon with us, and then went for Durham. At the King's Head for my part of the bill paid thirteen shillings, for horses at the King's Head paid three shillings. To servants at the King's Head gave five shillings. Mr. Hall, nor myself, would not suffer the captain any part of the bill to be paid by him. We had for dinner a leg of mutton roasted only, to a poor man of Easton who lately lost an horse, and who came to my house this afternoon gave two shillings sixpence. Mr. Hall, being with me, gave him the same. Mrs. Davy still at my house, and dined and slept here again, quite tired and fatigued this evening. March 19th. 
sent by my maid betty to one tooley whose family has got the smallpox and is very poor two shillings sixpence march twentieth about twelve o'clock i took a ride to Durham and will went with me got there about two o'clock put up my horses at the king's arms kept by one girling and there i supped and slept had a very good bed soon after i got to Durham i walked to mr hall's rooms he lodges at a barber's by name field and there i dined and spent the afternoon with him we had for dinner a fine lobster hot and some mutton steaks had from the king's arms before dinner mr hall and myself took a walk about Durham went and saw a whimsical building called quebec we dined at three o'clock and after we had smoked a pipe etc we took a ride to the house of industry about two miles west of Durham, and a very large building at present though there wants another wing about three hundred and eighty poor in it now but they don't look either healthy or cheerful a great number die there twenty-seven have died since christmas last we returned from thence to the king's arms and then we supped and spent the evening together to mr hall's clerk of garveston who came to give him notice of a burial on friday being very poor gave one shilling march twenty first i breakfast with mr hall at his lodgings to a barber for shaving me etc gave sixpence after breakfast we took a walk called at miss gage's school and saw betsy davy who cried on seeing us miss gage the mistress never came to us though at home which i think was very rude and impolite in her after that we took a long walk about the town about one o'clock mr hall took a ride with me to weston and dined and spent the afternoon with us mr hall's horse fell with him on hockering heath and threw him off but luckily received no hurt march twenty fourth the four highwaymen that infested these roads last winter were all tried at the assizes held last week at thetford found guilty and all condemned since that they made an attempt to get out of the castle and very near completed an escape march thirty first had a letter from one singlehurst of the town of nottingham petitioning for poor c lewis's family and am not able to assist them having so many demands april first i read prayers and preached this morning at weston neither my squire or lady at church being from home mr hardy and his wife dined with our folks in kitchen nancy and myself took a walk this afternoon to mr custance's new hall stayed there an hour and returned to one bushel for showing us the house gave nancy walked there and back very well not very much tired she walked up to the top rooms though the staircase has no rail to get and looks dangerous to go up april seventh gave my servant will leave to go to norwich this morning to see the three highwaymen hung there to-day will returned about seven o'clock in the evening they were all three hung and appeared penitent the names of the highwaymen were william skipper michael moore william fletcher skipper was most abandoned but cried at the last april fourteenth i got up very ill this morning about eight o'clock having had none or very little sleep all the night owing to the pain in my ear which was much worse in the night and broke and a good deal of blood only came away the pain continued still very bad all the morning though not quite so bad as before it made me very uneasy about it a throbbing pain in my ear continued till i went to bed i put a roasted onion into my ear going to bed to-night april fifteenth i breakfast dined supped and slept again at home nancy breakfast dined etc here again i thank god i had a tolerable good night to sleep and was much better this morning for it i read prayers and administered the holy sacrament this morning at weston being easter day had a loin of veal roasted for dinner as usual on easter day my clerk and james hardy of ringland dined with our folks continued brave though low thank god all day april twenty second went to brand this morning and read prayers and administered the holy sacrament there for mr bottom brand is about six miles from my house there were only six communicants myself one of them 
I read prayers and preached this afternoon at Weston. Had a very large congregation this afternoon at church. We did not dine till the afternoon service was over. April 23rd. Mr. Townsend's gamekeeper, Jack, brought me over this morning a greyhound puppy by order of Mr. Townsend. I gave the gamekeeper for bringing it over two shillings sixpence. May 2nd. I breakfast and slept again at the King's Head. He had gone to Norwich the day before. About eleven this morning Mrs. Davy, with my niece, came to Norwich in Lenwaid chaise, and my servant Will came with them on horseback. They went to Mr. Priest's, where they are to sleep. After breakfast I took a walk till one o'clock by myself, called on Manning, and bespoke an urn for Nancy, also a copper kitchen and a copper coal scoop. At Chase's, for Skipper's narrative, paid sixpence. At Scott's, for a pair of riding gloves, paid two shillings tuppence. Called on my mercer, Mr. Smith, and bespoke a coat, waistcoat, and pair of shoes, and a fishing frock. To the driver of Lenway chaise, gave one shilling sixpence. To my man Will, to go to the play tonight, gave one shilling. At two o'clock, went to Mr. Priest's, and there dined and spent part of the afternoon with him, his wife, and family, a Mrs. Hay of Tuddenham, Mrs. Davy, and Nancy. We had for dinner some codfish and cockle sauce, a forequarter of lamb, tarts, and jellies. After dinner called at Mr. Francis's, etc., returned to tea at Mr. Priest's. Mrs. Cooper drank tea there. About six o'clock Mr. Priest, his son John, and myself took a walk to the theatre. Mrs. Davy and Nancy went in a hackney coach thither. For the coach I paid one shilling. We all sat in one of the front boxes. The theatre was pretty full. The play was The Royal Suppliants a new tragedy for the benefit of Mr. and Mrs. Holland. The entertainment, Harlequin Touchstone. Between the play and entertainment, an interlude called Buxom Joan, or The Farmer's Journey to London. They collected at the theater for this night fifty-two pounds. I treated Mrs. Davy, Nancy, and John Priest with tickets. For four tickets I paid twelve shillings. After the play, etc., the ladies, etc., returned to Mr. Priest's. I went to my inn, had some rum and water, and went to bed. May 4th, we, Mrs. Davy is again staying at the rectory, were very merry this morning with Nancy, making her believe that she took a bad half-guinea at Norwich, and which I took off her again, and gave her only nine shillings sixpence. I soon after sent it to Carrie's and got ten shillings sixpence for it, which greatly heightened our mirth. She had the one shilling after. Mate Mrs. Howe came after Nancy about one o'clock in her chaise to carry her to Hockering to dinner. I rode my mare thither, and there we dined and spent the afternoon with Mr. and Mrs. Howes, Mrs. Davy, Mr. Dawson and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Payne of Shipton, and Mr. Dekeen. Mr. Dawson is a clergyman and has a living, but his tenets are Presbyterian. He married Mr. Howe's eldest daughter, lives at Wingfield. May 16th, between seven and eight o'clock this morning, went down to the river a-fishing with my nets. Ben, Will, Jack, Harry Donnell, and William Legate, Ben's brother, were my fishermen. We begun at Lenwaid Mill, and fished down to Morton, and we had the best day of fishing we ever had. We caught at one draught only ten full pails of fish, pike, trout, and flatfish. The largest fish we caught was a pike, which was a yard long and weighed upwards of thirteen pound after he was brought home. We caught about twenty brace of pike, but threw back all the small ones. Also we caught about fifteen brace of trout, the largest not more than a pound and a half. All the smallest were threw back, three brace also of perch, one tolerable tench, and I dare say near, if not quite five hundred brace of roach and dace. Prodigious sport indeed we had to-day, though cold and wet. As we were fishing by Copland's, he came out and ordered my men off from his land, and behaved quite contrary to the opinion I had of him. After talking with him some little time, he said I might fish, but then I would not, at which he seemed rather uneasy. 
we eat some cold meat which we carried about one o'clock and returned home to dinner at four for beer at barnard dunnell's of morton paid one shilling gave beeston cantrell palmer of morton and barnard dunnell some pike and most of the flat fish to the poor at lenwade and morton and of my own parish harry dunnell and will legate dined etc with our folks paid them also for their labor to-day three shillings i was rather fatigued this evening by fishing may seventeenth mr priest of norwich came to my house about one o'clock and he stayed and dined with us and spent the afternoon and in the evening returned to norwich i was very glad to see him as he and wife behaved very civil to nancy mr and mrs howes mrs davy and mr de Keene dined and spent the afternoon with us also in my company dinner my great pike which was roasted and a pudding in his belly some boiled trout perch and tench eel and gudgeon fried a neck of mutton boiled and a plain pudding for mrs howes all my company were quite astonished at the sight of the great pike on the table was obliged to lay him on two of the largest dishes and was laid on part of the kitchen window shutters covered with a cloth i never saw a nobler fish at any table it was very well cooked and though so large was declared by all the company to be prodigious fine eating being so moist at quadrille after tea neither won or lost at about nine they all left us i put a large pike into the boot of mr howe's chaise before he went may nineteenth my man ben went early this morning to norwich with my white cow and calf to sell he returned about three this afternoon having sold them and paid me for them five pounds five shillings i gave him out of it two shillings sixpence may twenty first a mr smith an attorney and who was with me the first time of my coming to weston to settle some matters between mrs ridley and myself called on me this evening for a copy of the register concerning his son's age who is now at new college and fellow there his son is going to take orders soon i never saw his son he stayed with me about half an hour and then walked to peachman's where he is to sleep being his tenant may twenty second at one o'clock took a ride to mr bottom's at mattishall and there dined and spent the afternoon with him mrs bottom old mr down and wife of dernham and their granddaughter a miss down from london a fine girl about sixteen a mr gridson a young clergyman mr and mrs howes mrs davy and mr de Kane. it was mattishall gaunt to-day i was late to dinner mr down of durham came in a new contrived machine with only two wheels and is drawn by one horse only it answers both the end of a chair and a post-chaise it has front and side windows when shut up and when down and thrown back a chair it is a very good contrivance and cost him forty guineas mr grigson appears to be a sensible good young man we had for dinner boiled beef of pie custards and tarts at quadrille this afternoon to a little girl at mr bottom's gave sixpence as i went to mr bottom's called at east tuddenham and saw the church and the new altarpiece there it is a very handsome one but put much too low mr howe's man bird and my man will kept us later than we intended to stay being gone to the gaunt and not come back till near nine o'clock i did not stay for my man but went with duquesne when he did about half past eight i went with duquesne as far as tuddenham and then went home by myself which i did not like will came home about eleven o'clock but i did not see him to-night i am very sorry that he behaves so as the last time we were at mr bottom's the same was done and mr howe's man then by name ty was turned off may twenty third i talked coolly and calmly to will this morning and told him that it would not be in my power to excuse him any more for such behavior and that he would be cautious may twenty eighth 
About two o'clock Mrs. Custance came in her coach after Nancy to go with her to Ringland to dinner. Mrs. Custance wanted me to go in the coach also, but I preferred riding on horseback. We dined and spent the afternoon with them and Mr. Duquesne. We had for dinner some mackerel, a couple of fowls boiled, and a tongue, a leg of mutton roasted for the first course, some pigeons and asparagus, tartlets, raspberry cream, and blancmange with currant jelly. We spent a very agreeable day at Ringland. We returned to Weston about nine in the evening. Mrs. Custant made my niece a present of a very fine India fan, another for common use, but all the fashion at London, a fine tortoise-shell shuttle, and also a pretty straw basket for to hold work. Mrs. Custance is very fond of Nancy, and so is she of her. May 30th. Nancy scarce eat anything for dinner today. I desired her not to eat too much, and therefore she would not eat after, neither would she eat any supper. June 3rd. I read prayers and administered the Holy Sacrament this morning at Weston Church, being Whit Sunday. It rained very heavy in the night, a thunderstorm, with little thunder or lightning, but much rain. All nature seemed this morning greatly refreshed by the rain, as it was so much wanted. Thanks be to the Lord for so blessed and gracious a rain. My squire and lady at church, and at the Holy Sacrament. Nancy also was at church, and at the Holy Sacrament, by my desire, and was the first time of her ever receiving it. My clerk, James Smith, dined with our folks to-day. June 8th, Mr. and Mrs. Custance and Mr. Duquesne dined and spent the afternoon with us, and stayed till eight o'clock in the evening. Mr. and Mrs. Custance were dressed very neat. We put their coach in my barn. I gave them for dinner a couple of chicken boiled and a tongue, a leg of mutton boiled, and capers and batter pudding for the first course. Second, a couple of ducks roasted and green peas, some artichokes, tarts, and blancmange. After dinner, almonds and raisins, oranges and strawberries, mountain and port wines. Peas and strawberries the first gathered this year by me. We spent a very agreeable day, and all well pleased and merry. June 10th. I slept but very indifferent last night very sickly time now, many very ill in ague and fever. I read prayers and preached this afternoon at Weston. I prayed for John Bowles at church, almost dead by drinking. Neither my squire nor lady at church this afternoon. June 11th, to a poor old soldier who sells matches by name Clem, Sims, near eighty years old, and who broke his leg about Christmas last, gave this morning sixpence. He used to call on me about once in half a year. He has a pension from the government of about seven pounds a year. June thirteenth. I spent this morning and read prayers by John Bowles being ill and prayed for Sunday last at church. I found him in bed, but a great deal better than I expected to find him, speaks very strong, eats very little, is blind, and has a pain in his stomach, all from drinking to some poor children gave tuppence. June 18th, to one cock of Booton, and another man also of the same place, who very lately had their house burnt down and lost almost their all, gave five shillings. I gave Nancy to give to them also two shillings sixpence. In the evening took a ride to Norwich, and supped and slept at the King's Head. I sent my horses back to Weston by my man Will. June 20th, I called on Mr. Francis, Sr., this morning, and talked with him about a letter he sent me to pay in the one hundred pounds to know whether he could get it for me by the time, but he declined very coolly. It made me rather uneasy, and made me rather wish I had never borrowed it at all. However, I hope I shall manage it some way or other. I called on Francis also last night, but Parrot of Saham being there did not talk of it. June 24th, Mrs. Davy came after Nancy this evening in Mrs. Howe's chaise, by appointment, as Nancy is to spend a few days with them at Hockering. 
Received a letter this afternoon by my squire's servant from Mrs. Leneve, dated from Windsor, to desire me, as she intends visiting Oxford soon, to send her a line or two to the warden of New College by way of introducing her to him. Her daughters are with her and are to go with her. Also for me to recommend an inn to her in Oxford. Was very dull and low this evening, and the more so, being quite alone. June 26. About six o'clock Mrs. Custance, with her two little boys and their nurse, came to my house, and the young gentlemen supped here, on bread and milk. They returned home to Weston about nine o'clock. June 28. Mr. Duquesne asked me to dine with him, as he has a large company at his house, but would not. However, I promised to drink tea with them. Mr. Duquesne's man Robert, a very old servant, very ill, in the fever that prevails so much in Norfolk now. Very bad at Norwich. Fifty-three were buried last week there. I sent Will to wait at table at dinner at Duquesne's. I dined at home by myself on a leg of mutton roasted. June 30th. Nancy, by being with Mrs. Davy, had learnt some of her extravagant notions, and talked very high all day. I talked with her against such foolish notions, which made her almost angry with me, but when we went to bed we were very good friends, and she was convinced. July 1st. Poor Robert England, Mr. Duquesne's old servant, died this afternoon in the fever that rages so much. He drove Mr. Duquesne's chaise to Norwich, and back again, with Mr. Priest and wife in it, only Wednesday last. Mr. Duquesne is sorely grieved about him. July 3rd. Mr. Baldwin called on me this morning, but did not stay long. He walked into my garden. I gave him some artichokes to carry home to Mrs. Baldwin. July 9th. I took a ride this morning to Duquesne's, found him very low, and sorely vexed for his poor man Robin. He was then just going off for London. I was wet through before I got to Duquesne's. I am really sorry to see Duquesne so very much dejected. From Duquesne's rode on to Howe's to let them know that I should expect them at my rotation tomorrow. I saw only Mr. and Mrs. Howe's, Mrs. Davy at Norwich. I returned to dinner by three o'clock. July 13th. Mackay, gardener at Norwich, called here this evening and he walked over my garden with me, and then went away. He told me how to preserve my fruit trees, etc., from being injured for the future by the ants, which was to wash them well with soap suds after our general washing, especially in the winter. July 17th. Mr. Galland and Mr. Howlett called on me this evening to advise them what to do with one Norton, who threatens to burn half the parish, he has burnt this afternoon all the brake upon the common that Mr. Howlett had cut to put under his stacks. He is a sad rogue, I believe. I advised them to have a warrant and secure him. He was therefore this evening secured by the constables. July 18th. Norton was had before a justice this morning, but he was done nothing to, as the justice could not have proof. July 24th. I read a good deal of the history of England today to Nancy whilst she was netting her apron. Very dry again. I feed my geese with cabbage now. July 30th. Nancy and myself get up every morning before seven o'clock under the penalty of forfeiting sixpence each day, Sunday only excepted. End of section 24, 1781, part 1. Section 25 of The Diary of a Country Parson by James Woodford. Read by John Greenman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1781, Part 2. August 2nd. Mr. and Mrs. Custance got into their new house for the first time to sleep there, but Mrs. Custance was taken ill before she got there, supposed to be in labor. August 6th, Nancy took a walk this morning to Mr. Custance's new house, and there stayed and dined and spent the afternoon there. I walked in the afternoon there and drank tea, and about eight walked back to our house with Nancy. Begun shearing wheat today. 
harvest very forward gave mrs davy a very genteel steel corkscrew this afternoon gave nancy some muslin to make a shawl august eighth about two o'clock a strange young man called at my house shabbily dressed with one shoulder higher than the other to ask me leave to set up a school in this parish said he came from yarmouth and was recommended he said by a mr gosling of yarmouth to this parish brought no character with him said also he was a scotchman i told him that i thought it strange that he should apply without any kind of certificate character etc a suspicious man i take him and might belong to a bad crew but hope not august twelfth i read prayers and preached this morning at weston mr and mrs custance both at church and it being so hot they were afraid that they should be obliged to go out of church during the service but did not poor john bowles died this morning about ten o'clock hope he is departed out of this life for a better one poor man he killed himself by drinking so much spirit august fourteenth i buried this evening about seven o'clock in the church poor john bowles aged sixty-three years most of the parish attended at the funeral which was a very decent one peachman stephen andrews mann john pegg william dade and page pallbearers and had silk hatbands and gloves i had also a silk hatband and a pair of gloves and as he was buried in the church and for breaking of the ground received ten shillings sixpence august sixteenth i took a walk this morning to mr custance's but neither of them at home being gone to visit mr bacon of earlham i stayed and chatted with the children some time august eighteenth mr decane returned home wednesday last the archbishop of canterbury and his lady mrs cornwallis are come also to mr townsend's at honningham note frederick cornwallis d d seventeen thirteen to seventeen eighty three he succeeded dr seeker see pages two fifty five to two fifty six footnote at archbishop of canterbury in seventeen sixty eight though apparently a popular man he was a prelate very much of the world and altogether inferior to his predecessor in talents he married in seventeen fifty nine caroline townsend a sister to mr charles townsend of honingham see page two hundred and eleven hence his visit there see the primates of the four georges by alfred w rowden k c nineteen sixteen also d n b august twenty first nancy and myself dined and spent the afternoon at mr john custance's at the new hall with him and mrs custance they sent their coach after us and carried us back home in it we had for dinner ham and two fowls boiled some young beans veal collops and hash mutton for the first course a roast duck baked puddings apple tart etc second they behaved very civil and very friendly to us mrs custance gave nancy a pearl necklace and pearl chain to hang from the necklace a pair of pearl earrings and another pair of earrings mrs custance is exceedingly kind to my niece indeed we returned home about eight o'clock in the evening after spending a very agreeable day august twenty second i took a ride to decane's this morning stayed with him about an hour found him rather low still and fretting himself about being so tied by the leg in dancing backward and forward to townsend's with his great company the archbishop of canterbury and lady are there etc the archbishop and lady go from townsend's saturday next decane is then determined to visit his neighbors though townsend be ever so much affronted at it august twenty fifth nancy had a letter this evening from her father in which he mentions the death of poor tom sims by a fall from a horse poor fellow hope he is much happier than he was here august twenty seventh nancy saw sir william jernigan and a general jernigan a german at mr custance's the general is some relation to sir william's lives in germany a very good kind of man august thirtieth 
about two o'clock took a walk to mr custance's and there dined and spent the afternoon with him mrs custance and mr martineau a man midwife from norwich a sensible young gentleman and well behaved see page two hundred and ninety two footnote and my niece we returned home in mr custance's coach and mr and mrs custance attended us in it but they did not unlight i was very low and dull going to bed to-night and could not go to sleep we had for dinner to-day a couple of fowls roasted a piece of boiled beef stewed mutton fricasseed rabbits a currant pudding and tarts mr rollins mr custance's architect also dined with us to-day september ninth i read prayers and preached this morning at weston my squire and lady both at church as was nancy as i was walking to church i met mr custance's coach and four about half way from my house with mr and mrs custance in it coming after nancy to carry her to church but she was gone to church before it was very kind of them by so intending during my sermon at church a poor woman was taken in fits which disconcerted the whole congregation and made me conclude sooner than i intended they could not get her out of church the woman was old richard bates wife an old woman one guinea's worth of bread was given away this morning to the poor of weston a legacy of late john bowles a much greater number of poor people at church this morning than used to be owing to the above spraggs my gardener dined with our folks to-day he being at weston church september eighteenth at noon took a walk to mr custance's and to my great surprise as well as satisfaction mr custance acquainted me that his wife was brought to bed this morning of another boy and that they were both extremely well mr custance desired me to christen the child which i did immediately and by name william he asked me to dine with them but could not i returned therefore home to dinner and told nancy of the good news of mrs custance being brought to bed she was very glad to hear of it and that they were well to lizzie's mother mrs greaves for six turkeys this afternoon paid nine shillings september nineteenth weston bells rung yesterday and again to-day on mrs custance being brought to bed and in the new house september twenty second i breakfast dined supped and slept again at home nancy breakfast dined etc etc here again to an old man of Reapham for forty oysters paid two shillings sixpence mrs davy and with her alexander payne made us a morning visit stayed with us about an hour and returned home to my butcher's man simons for pork at three and a half pounds six shillings sixpence mr custance my squire made us also a visit this morning immediately almost after mrs davy left us and he also stayed with us an hour mrs custance brave my name i saw inserted on the norwich paper this evening as preacher at the general's next monday at aylsham the archdeacon dr burney the death of mrs Lenieve, mentioned on the norwich paper also as happening at london and of a raging fever pray god she be happy and send comfort o lord to her two disconsolate orphan daughters september twenty third there was a grand funeral at ringland to-day about noon poor mrs Lenieve brought from london there september twenty fourth at eight this morning took a ride to aylsham about ten miles from weston with my man will coleman we got there about ten put up my horses at the three black boys and then sent for a barber dressed myself in my gown and cassock and scarf being the archdeacon's visitation to-day and went about eleven o'clock to church where mr taswell read prayers and after prayers i ascended the pulpit and gave them a sermon from church we returned to the three boys to dinner the clergy present were as follows the rev mr green who sat in the chair and represented the archdeacon dr burney myself next as preacher mr taswell next as reader mr priest of Reapham, mr whitmell mr brown mr sandford mr bryant mr leith and mr juvel myself and taswell were treated by the chairman to a barber at aylsham gave ninepence 
Mr. Morfu, Mr. Morse, Mr. Priest's son, Richard, and a Mr. Robbins dined with the clergy at Aylsham. It was almost unanimously agreed by the clergy that the generals should be alternately at Aylsham and Repham, and desired Mr. Morphew to mention it to the archdeacon. Lent my servant Will at Aylsham this morning, ten shillings sixpence. We broke up at about four o'clock, and then I mounted my mare and returned home to Weston about six. The church of Aylsham is large and handsome, and an organ at the west end of it, and which was played. We had for dinner part of a rump of beef boiled, a loin of veal roasted, three fowls roasted, and a ham with some plain puddings. It was a shabby dinner and overdone. Plates, knives, and forks were shabby indeed. To Mr. Morphew paid for procurations and pascals nine shillings seven and a half pence. I drank some spruce beer of Mr. Taswell's at dinner and liked it very well. It was in bottles. October 2nd. I breakfast, dined, supped and slept again at home. Nancy breakfast, dined, etc., here again. To an old poor man, Thomas Wall, gave this morning tuppence. Ben caught a hare in the cover this morning with ye dogs. Cut my Patagonian cucumbers this morning. The largest weighed fourteen pounds, the other twelve pounds. October 4th. Mr. Burroughs of Morton called on me this morning to let me know that Captain Legris had heard that I had carried from his gravel pit a large quantity of gravel lately, and more than was promised me, and that I would make some acknowledgment for the same. But I believe it is Burroughs' scheme to get some money for himself. I intend waiting on Mr. Legris concerning it when I go to Norwich. Mrs. Custance, though only brought to bed about a fortnight, called here this morning in her coach and took Nancy with her to spend the day with her at the new hall. She is very finely and brave indeed, am heartily glad for it. At two o'clock took a walk to Mr. Custance's, and there dined. Spent the afternoon and evening till eight o'clock. Mrs. Custance dined by herself above stairs. Mr. Press Custance, a Mr. Walton, who is a portrait painter from London and is drawing Mr. Custance's picture, and Mr. Rawlings, the architect, dined with us there. We had for dinner a jugged hare, a leg of mutton roasted, stewed beef and hashed duck for the first course, besides a fine piece of boiled beef on the side table. For the second course we had a brace of pheasants roasted, some grilled oysters, pudding and tarts and custards. After tea, Mrs. Custance, Nancy, Mr. Custance, Mr. Press Custance, Mr. Walton, and Self played a pool of commerce of one shilling apiece, drawing two pences, at which I lost sixpence. Nancy lost one shilling sixpence, having bought in a second time. Mrs. Custance won the pool, in all neat, four shilling sixpence. Myself and Nancy returned home in Mr. Custance's coach. We spent a very agreeable day at the new hall. The weather also was very fine, evening cold, rather. October 5th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Nancy breakfast, dined, etc., here again. Mr. Charles Townsend of Honingham called on me this morning about eleven o'clock, and walked round my gardens with me and afterwards came in and sat with us about half an hour, and then retired. He caught me on the hop, busy in my garden, and dressed in my cotton morning gown, old wig and hat. Soon after Mr. Townsend left us, Dr. Thorne of Mattishall made us a visit, walked about the garden, ate some grapes, and after spending half an hour with us in my study, he went away. About two o'clock Mr. Decane and Mr. Priest of Repham, in Mr. Priest's chaise, came to us and dined, and spent the afternoon with us, and part of the evening till eight o'clock, and then they went on to Decane's. I gave them for dinner a bit of boiled beef, a boiled fowl with pork and greens, and a hare roasted. After tea we played one pool at quadrille, neither won or lost. This has been quite a levy day with us. October 7th, about five o'clock this afternoon, 
who should come to my house but hall who has just come into norfolk from hampshire he supped and spent the evening with us and wanted sadly to sleep at my house but it could not be he slept at lenwade bridge left us about nine o'clock hall fights very cunning about self he loves himself too well and would fain get a firmer footing at my house i never asked him to come to my house when he went he is very bold and will not take broad hints he will do anything to save his own pocket to a brief for fire gave one shilling october eighth mr hall never called here this morning october eleventh i breakfast and dined at the king's head he had written to norwich the day before to mr baker for things at his shop paid nineteen shillings sixpence that is tobacco pot four shillings sixpence three choir of paper gilt two shillings sixpence eight choir of paper not gilt three shillings three corkscrews one shilling two pair of nut crackers two shillings glass crackers sixpence humming top one shilling bottle of dalmahoy's perfume one shilling netting needles for nancy ninepence small candlestick for wax one shilling sixpence ivory thing to wind silk or thread sixpence crackers threepence ivory needles sixpence bandalore sixpence in all nineteen shillings sixpence called at captain legrace's this morning about some gravel but he was not at home had a long chat however with his wife then called at mr francis's saw mr and mrs francis jr but not the senior from thence called and saw miss leneve in st stephen's churchyard her sister was in the country miss leneve seemed pretty well after her great loss of a good mother there was a man with her of about fifty years old and i believe is a quaker as he kept his hat on all the time his name was not inserted by a diarist a near relation of the late mrs leneve's miss leneve told me that her mother wondered that she did not hear from me when she was at windsor but i told her that i did send her a letter as she desired and in it one to the warden of new college by her desire the letter miscarried owing to its not being properly directed as mrs leneve forgot to mention her address at windsor and therefore i only directed it to her at windsor from miss leneve went to mr hall who has lodgings near st peter's church behind the market-place at a glazier's by name smith he was very glad to see me and pressed me to dine with him as he was just going to dinner but did not as i intended dining at priests but when i got thither they had all dined so i went to my inn and there made a running dinner about three mr hall came to me soon after dinner and drank a glass of wine with me and about half past four o'clock i left norwich my man will bringing my horses in the morn paid and gave at the king's head about eleven shillings to mr priest for an ounce of the best rhubarb paid three shillings to a mr chamber for half an ounce ditto paid two shillings we got home to weston about six o'clock and there supped and slept at home nancy very glad to see me returned having been alone all the time october seventeenth gave my men ben and will leave to go to st faith's fair to-day they returned in good time in the evening they had my horses to go thither mr custance sent his coach after nancy and myself about two o'clock for us to go and dine with them by appointment and we dined and spent the afternoon with mr and mrs custance lady bacon mr duquesne mr press custance mr carter the new clergyman of ringland a mr walton who is a painter and whom we saw before there we had for dinner the first course some fish pike a fine large piece of boiled beef peas soup stewed mutton goose giblets stewed etc second course a brace of partridges a turkey roasted baked pudding lobster scalloped oysters and tartlets the desert black and white grapes walnuts and small nuts almonds and raisins damson cheese and golden pippins 
Madeira, Lisbon, and port wines to drink. We returned home about eight o'clock as we went. Duquesne went with us and returned with us in the coach, he leaving his horse at my house during the time. Nancy, nor myself, can make nothing of Mr. Carter as yet. He is a short man, black and ordinary, though young. Mr. Duquesne stayed with us about a quarter of an hour and then went home on horseback and a man with him. October 18th. Mr. Forster of this parish lost a little boy this morning. I privately named it in January last. It was never brought to church to be presented. I am sorry for it. A great negligence in the parents of it, I think. October 22nd. Mr. Carter of Ringland made us a long morning visit, and for the first time. He is a sensible man. October 23rd. Mr. Howes and Mrs. Davy called this morning at about eleven o'clock. Mrs. Howes so weak that she could not get out. Mrs. Davy stayed, dined, and spent the afternoon with us. Mrs. Howes returned back again in the chaise. At half-past one Lady Bacon and Mrs. Custance in a coach and four made us a morning visit, stayed with us about an hour, and then returned home. Mrs. Davy was highly pleased with Mrs. Custance, as indeed must everybody who has once seen her. Mrs. Custance brought Nancy a present of a leer, lawn handkerchief, and the Queen's lace, as it is called for her stays. We had for dinner a fowl boiled, and a tongue, a piece of roast beef, and a plain Norfolk pudding. Mrs. Davy returned in the evening to hockering in the chaise. October 25th. Mr. Hall called on us about noon, but did not dine with us, though I asked him, as I dine at three o'clock. He is not looked upon in this neighborhood so much as he used to be, as his visits are merely interested for himself, and that he never makes any kind of return for the same, not even the smallest present to any person. October 26th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Nancy, breakfast, dined, etc., here again. Took a ride about noon to Mr. Custance's, saw him, his wife, and Lady Bacon. They were all full-dressed and just going to Earlham to Mr. Bacon's to dinner. Took a ride from thence to Lenwade Bridge, and so home. Beckham, the net-maker, called here at dinner, and he dined with our folks. He fights cunning. He came to mend my drag-net but I would not have him mended at my house, as I know him to be an expensive boarder. If he has it to his house to mend, it will cost me one pound two shillings ninepence, which is very dear indeed. I told him that I would send it to his house if it was to be mended by him. I saw Mr. Custance's new brew-house when there today, everything on a very large scale, so large as to brew eight barrels at a brewing every article most convenient. October 29th. Mr. Carey and Mr. Hardy dined with our folks today. Clerk Hewitt of Mattishallburg called on me this evening by desire of Mrs. Davy to taste some smuggled gin, which I liked, and he is to bring me a tub this week. November 1st. Mrs. Custance, with her little boys, made us a short visit this morning. I gave her eldest boy, Hamilton, an humming top. I gave George also a silent top, which I bought for them some time ago. November 2nd. It rained so all the morning till two o'clock that I was afraid I could not go to dine at Mr. Townsend's, but at a quarter after two it began to abate, and then I dressed and took a ride to Mr. Duquesne's, where I found Mr. Priest, and after staying about half an hour with them, and there we all three went to Mr. Townsend's. Mr. Duquesne and Mr. Priest went in Duquesne's chaise, myself on horseback, and we all dined and spent the afternoon with Mr. and Mrs. Townsend and stayed there till nine at night, and then we returned and supped at Duquesne's. We did not dine till four o'clock. We had for dinner a cod's head, a chine of mutton, veal collops, pudding baked, etc., second course an hare roasted and a pheasant some amulet macaroni and tarts etc madeira and port wines to drink 
we were at mr townsend's near an hour before dinner during that time we went into the billiard room and i played one game of billiards with mrs townsend and beat her though she plays very well we dined in the dining-room and drank coffee and tea in the drawing-room which is hung with silk and most magnificent furniture in it the grate in it the finest i ever saw all of steel and most highly polished it cost nineteen guineas after tea we played quadrille neither won or lost upon the whole we spent a most agreeable day there on our return to decanes mr priest's eldest daughter was there being returned thither from norwich i supped and spent the evening at decanes with him mr priest and daughter i got home about eleven at night mr priest and daughter slept at decanes my man will went with me to mr townsend's etc sent a letter this evening to my sister pounsett nancy was well pleased on my going out to-day november sixth mrs custance in a riding habit came to my house this morning on foot with her two eldest boys and a servant boy with them about twelve o'clock much tired and very dirty and wet as were her little boys mrs custance changed her shoes and stockings and had some of nancy's mrs custance drank some warm red wine and water which i hope will prevent her catching cold as did the little boys being obliged to go to lenwade bridge to settle dr bathard's tithe accounts i left mrs custance etc at my house and went to lenwade bridge but called at mr custance's in my road thither and acquainted mr custance of mrs custance and the little boys being at my house and there i dined and spent the afternoon with bathurst's parishioners and received their compositions from most of them and about six returned home to weston and found nancy gone as mrs custance desired her to return and dine with her she went in the coach and returned by herself in the same between seven and eight this evening november tenth my boy coming from mr custance's this morning found a hare sitting and we went with our greyhounds to course it which we did and had a tolerable good course though short and killed it i gave jack finding her as i used to do on finding a hare one shilling clerk hewitt of mattishalburg brought me a tub of gin this evening about five o'clock paid him for it one pound five shillings gave him also for his trouble of bringing it one shilling we had nineteen bottles and a pint of the tub november fourteenth about noon took a ride to norwich with my man will and dined supped and slept at the king's head as soon as i got to norwich i went to kerrison's bank and there received for cash etc a note of a hundred and thirty seven pounds which i immediately enclosed in a letter to dr bathurst of christchurch oxford i walked to the post office and put the letter into the post which sets for london this evening at ten o'clock i then went to the king's head and eat a mutton chop and before i had quite dined mr hall came to me and we smoked a pipe and drank a bottle of wine took a walk about norwich till after nine and then we supped and spent the evening together at the king's head till after eleven o'clock and then mr hall went to his lodgings and i went to bed walking so much this evening etc made me rather fainty november fifteenth i breakfast and spent the morning at norwich after breakfast took a walk to baker's and bought a smelling bottle of burnt salts for which i paid one shilling for a comb also at baker's sixpence for a silent top also at baker's paid sixpence at mr beatniff's ladies pocket book for seventeen eighty two paid one shilling at mr toll's for a pair of cotton stockings for nancy paid seven shillings sixpence called on mr hall about eleven o'clock and we took a walk to mr landy's in the market-place a chemist and druggist and bought of him one ounce of rhubarb three shillings of ditto for a small vial of goulard's extract paid threepence the above mr landy was of winchester and his mother whom i knew very well and often ticked with her lived in a house in college street and kept a huckster's shop there and she had many a shilling of me 
Mr. Landy is married and came from London to Norwich about three years ago. He has a very good shop and house. I did not see his wife. I invited him over to Weston. I returned to the King's Head about noon, paid my reckoning, and set off for Weston for dinner. I asked Hall to take a ride with me and dine at Weston, but he begged to be excused. Paid and gave at the King's Head, etc., thirteen shillings, ten pence. I made Mr. Hall pay his share at the King's Head. I got home at Weston about three o'clock and dined, supped and slept at the parsonage house. Nancy breakfast, dined, etc., at Weston. I was rather tired and fatigued by being out. Will informed me tonight of his being ill in the venereal way. November 17th, Will had from Mr. Thorne's for his complaint some salts and some pills. He took a dose of salts yesterday morning, and this evening took one pill, and is to take one every night till he has taken eight, and then to take another dose of salts. Dr. Thorne says that his complaint is nothing very bad, and will do well soon. November 21st, one of Mr. Aldrich's, who goes about with a cart with linens, cottons, lace, etc., called at our house this morning to know if we wanted anything in his way. He called here whilst Mrs. Howe and Mrs. Davy were here. I bought of him some cotton six yards for a morning gown for myself at two shillings sixpence per yard, paid fifteen shillings. Some chintz for a gown for Nancy, five yards, and one half, I paid one pound fourteen shillings. For an East Indian silk handkerchief for self, paid five shillings sixpence. Nancy also bought a linen handkerchief, etc., of him. Mrs. Howes bought a silk handkerchief of him also. November 26, Mr. Hall came here about twelve o'clock, and he stayed and dined and spent the afternoon with us. He went away about four o'clock and took his leave of us as he goes into Hampshire Wednesday next, with intent to stay there with his friends for some considerable time, finding it very disagreeable to board in this part of the country, and which it must be to him. We had for dinner some soup, a turkey roasted, and pudding. November 28th, I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Nancy spent the day, etc., at Hockering. Mr. Custance and his wife, etc., returned home this afternoon from Sir Edmund Bacon's. I sent to inquire after them in the evening, and they were very well. They sent me back the London papers, in one of which there was the following bad news from North America, that Lord Cornwallis, with seven thousand men, were obliged to surrender themselves all prisoners to the American army of fifteen thousand men. It was not authenticated sufficiently, being only mentioned in a morning paper from London. December 1st, I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Nancy, breakfast, dined, etc., here again. It is very true that Lord Cornwallis and his whole army and forty ships, a hundred and sixty cannon, etc., are all taken by the Americans and French in Virginia. Note, at Yorktown on October 19, 1781, see page 285 footnote my people went out a coursing this morning and they brought home a brace of hares a rabbit and a partridge which they found in a trap they saw a great many hares today and had fine sport i could not go out with them being busy december fourth the two miss lenives with another lady called here this morning in a chaise but i could not prevail upon them to get out as they were going to dine at Wichitnam. I asked them to dine with us and eat some of my frolic pudding this day, being my tithe audit, but they could not. The following farmers paid me their respective dues, but Mr. Dade and Mr. Page, Peachman, Howlett, Girling, Andrews, Rising, Dade, Page, Mann, Pegg, William and James Bidewell, Carey, Bush, Case, Baker, Forster, Buck, William and Thomas Leggett, Burroughs, Palmer of Morton for brother, Beans for Mrs. Pratt and Horner. They all dined and some stayed till very near twelve at midnight. Stephen Andrews and John Pegg very soon got quite drunk by strong beer. The latter was quite beastly, so, and spewed about the passage, etc. Very shameful in him. I gave them for dinner a leg of mutton boiled and capers, salt fish and eggs, 
a fine piece of roast beef and quantities of plum puddings, wine, punch, and strong beer to drink after. They drank five bottles and one half of rum, four bottles of wine, nine lemons made use of, and one pound and half of sugar from Carrie's. I received this day for tithe and glebe two hundred and forty pounds, two shillings, sixpence. It was rather too late before they went, but they waited to see the end of the bowls. N.B. I filled the bowls rather too full this year. We did not sup till after twelve o'clock, and did not get to bed till near two in the morning. December 6th, about twelve, Mrs. Howes and Mrs. Davy came here, and Mrs. Davy was left here to spend a few days with Nancy. Mrs. Howes returned back without getting out. Soon after Mrs. Howes went, Mrs. Custance, with her eldest son, came here in her coach and four, and they stayed with us for two hours. After that Mrs. Dunnell came here and paid me for tithe and glebe and call land, twenty pounds nine shillings sixpence, out of which I paid her for odd things, one pound six shillings tuppence. After that, just as we were going to dinner, Mr. Mountain of Witchenham called here and paid me tithe for Bathurst the sum of thirty-five pounds five shillings. Mrs. Davy dined, supped, and slept here with Nancy. We had for dinner some soup, a piece of beef boiled, and a fine hare roasted. At quadrille with dummy this evening won two shillings. December 7th. Immediately after breakfast I rode to Honingham and married a very odd couple, a fine young man about twenty-two years of age, by name Robert Martin, and an old, infirm, weak widow about fifty years of age, by name Jane Price, by license, and for Duquesne, as he was not returned home yet. I received for marrying them the usual fee there, five shillings. We had for dinner today a neck of mutton boiled and a goose at quadrille with dummy this evening one sixpence december tenth to my butcher henry baker this morning for meat for the whole year till now paid thirty seven pounds two shillings received of ditto for a calf one pound five shillings we had for dinner today a rabbit boiled and onions and a fine piece of roast beef december eleventh Sir Edmund Bacon and Mr. Custance made us a long morning visit. I signed a paper for Mr. Custance as a witness for seeing him write his name. About noon took a ride to Norwich, and my man Will went with me, but he returned back to Weston with my horses as soon as I got thither. I dined etc. at Norwich. As soon as I got to Norwich I walked to Mr. Francis's, and there dined and spent the afternoon with him, his wife, and Mr. Francis, Sr., we had for dinner a couple of rabbits, boiled, and onions, and some roast beef. After dinner I settled some money accounts with both the Mr. Francis's. To the senior paid him for a court dod, Esquire. Money lent me four or five years ago one hundred pounds. For interest for the above at five per cent, for one year and one month, and some odd days paid him besides five pounds, eight shillings, sixpence. December 12th. I breakfast and spent the morning at Norwich. Before breakfast walked to Lewis's shop and there bought six yards of printed linen for my undermaid at two shillings tuppence per yard, thirteen shillings. For a lining at one shilling a yard, fourteen shillings. Bought also six yards of black ground cotton for a morning gown for myself at two shillings fourpence, fourteen shillings to five yards also of l wide calico for a lining seven shillings sixpence after breakfast i took a walk to miss lenave's and paid them a year's rent for call land sixteen pounds i stayed with them near an hour they told me that they leave norwich next week for good and are going to london to reside i wish them happy to my tailor Harlan, by his man Forster, paid four pounds, sixteen shillings, sixpence. I sent by him to his men in the shop to drink one shilling. Went to the post office and gave one John Watson, who is under postmaster, my annual gift of two shillings, sixpence. At Chase's for Moore's Almanac for 1782, paid ninepence. 
at ditto for baldwin's pocket-book for ditto paid one shilling eightpence to my barber wylam for a new wig paid one pound five shillings in the fish market for some oysters six paid threepence for one couple of widgeon in the market paid one shilling sixpence my man will came with my horses this morning and at two this afternoon set off for weston paid and gave at the king's head six shillings sixpence i got home to dinner by four o'clock and there dined supped and slept at the parsonage nancy breakfast dined etc there again mrs davy breakfast dined etc there again we had for dinner to-day a couple of rabbits and onions and a fine turkey roasted for supper one of the widgeon roasted and which was very nice december sixteenth i read prayers and preached and churched a woman my boy jack's mother this morning at weston i gave her the churching fee and she dined at my house afterwards as did a young man by name fothergill who brought a note from mrs davy to nancy neither my squire or lady at church the former being ill december seventeenth to my malster palmer of morton for malt etc for the last year paid him this morning a bill of twenty two pounds one shilling sixpence december nineteenth to a poor lame boy of my gardener spraggs gave sixpence and some victuals and drink never known scarce such a continuation of so fine mild and open weather as we enjoy at this season spent a couple of hours this morning in my cover hunting rabbits and laying one of my fishing nets for them about the furs we caught one in the net and another the dogs caught both young december twenty first to poor people being st thomas day of weston that live in the parish gave each sixpence in all one pound two shillings sixpence december twenty fourth i took a walk to mr custance's this morning and spent an agreeable hour with him and his wife mr custance is but very poorly indeed and their youngest child also very ill they sent for dr dunn from norwich on the child's account early this morning their servant brought back a letter for my niece from the post office from her father who acquaints her that he is greatly distressed for money i paid for the letter eightpence gave the boy edward fourpence one shilling gave to the carpenters at mr custance's as i went into their shop at sandy hill to drink one shilling to john horner for hulver i e holly against christmas one shilling sent mrs custance a very fine coalflower this evening december twenty fifth i breakfast dined supped and slept again at home nancy breakfast dined etc here again i read prayers and administered the holy sacrament this morning at weston being christmas day my squire's lady at church and at the sacrament the squire was not well enough to attend richard bates richard buck tom carey tom carr tom dicker tom cushion and james smith my clerk all dined at my house i gave each of the poor old men one shilling being seven shillings we had a good piece of roast beef for dinner and plenty of plum puddings poor old tom carey could not dine here being ill but he is another day and have one shilling gave nancy this evening for card money etc as she is going to spend a few days at mattishall with mr and mrs bottom one pound one shilling to Sprague's lame son for a Christmas carol gave sixpence. December twenty sixth, I breakfast and slept again at home. Nancy breakfast at home. To Weston Ringers this morning gave two shillings sixpence. About twelve, Mr. Bottom of Mattishall came after my niece in his whiskey, and at one they went off for Mattishall. I gave Mr. Bottom a fine hare to carry home with him in the whiskey i went with them part of the way on my mare and my man will with me i went from them to go and see mrs howes who is but poorly again saw her mr howes mrs george payne mrs davy and betsy the family there in great distress about alexander payne who made away with himself on sunday last by throwing himself headlong into a deep pit 
He married one of Mr. Howes's daughters, but his circumstances being but very badly is supposed to be the cause of so rash an action. The poor man, they say, had no vicious ways whatever, but no kind of economy or conduct in either him or his wife. I am very sorry for the poor fellow, indeed, he has been at my house more than once. I liked him very well. From Mrs. Howe's I went on to Mattishall, and there dined, spent the afternoon, supped and spent the evening at Mr. Bottom's, being his rotation day. Mr. Howe's, Mrs. Davy, Mr. Smith, Mr. Duquesne, Nancy and myself all dined with Mr. and Mrs. Bottom. We had for dinner some boiled beef, three fowls, roasted, a pig's face, stewed loin of mutton, peas soup, and mince pies. Mr. Howes and Mrs. Davy returned to hawkering about nine o'clock, and Mr. Smith took the advantage of their carriage to his house, as it rained then very much. Mr. Duquesne and myself being on horseback, and the weather very wet, about nine o'clock, we therefore stayed and supped with Mr. and Mrs. Bottom and my niece. We had for dinner some brawn, cold beef, and mince pies. Mr. Duquesne and self stayed till after eleven o'clock, and then, it being tolerable weather, we set off for our respective homes. I got home about twelve, and not very wet. My niece stayed and supped and slept at Mr. Bottom's. At Quadrille this evening won two shillings sixpence. I did not get to bed till after one o'clock. I had my bed warmed and was very comfortable. December 27th. I breakfast, dined, supped and slept again at home. To Mr. Carey for things from Norwich, etc., paid sixteen shillings, five pence. To Betty for bread, paid one pence. To Will for turnpikes, etc., paid ten pence. To Jack, money borrowed of him, paid one shilling. To my blacksmith's boy, a Christmas box, sixpence. To my butcher's son, a Christmas box, one shilling. Mr. Carey dined with our folks today as he could not on Christmas Day, not being well. Duquesne sent over to me this morning to desire me to dine with him today, but I begged to be excused. December 28th, I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Had my study chimney-place altered today by Mr. Hardy, and to prevent its smoking, but am still afraid of it. This is, I believe, the fourth time of altering it already. I was hurried all day about it, and also vexed. Mr. Hardy and his man, Tom Carr, dined in kitchen. December 29th. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Paid Mr. Hardy and man for work yesterday, two shillings, ninepence. About noon Mr. Bottom brought home Nancy in his whiskey. I desired him to dine with me on a fine hair, but he promised Mrs. Bottom to return home. Nancy dined, supped, and slept at home. To my gardener Spraggs, for work, paid four shillings. December 30th, I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Nancy breakfast, dined, etc., etc., here again. I read prayers, preached, and churched a woman this morning at Weston Church. My squire and lady at church, received for churching the woman, sixpence. Jack's brother Tom Wharton dined with our folks. December 31st. I breakfast, dined, supped, and slept again at home. Nancy breakfast, dined, etc., here again. To my Molster's man, a Christmas box, gave one shilling. To Mr. Carey, for things from Norwich, etc., paid six shillings, tuppence. Walked out a coursing this morning with my dogs for four hours. Had a very fine course with one hare, and which we at last killed saw no other hair. Betsy Davy was brought this morning on horseback from Hockering to spend a day or two with Nancy. She dined, supped, and slept here. Being the last day of the year, we sat up this night till after twelve o'clock, drank our friends' health everywhere with many returns of the present season, and went to bed. End of section 25, 1781, part 2, and end of the Diary of a Country Parson by James Woodford, read by John Greenman.